organized by the National Federation for Human Rights and by the uh, International Campaign uh, for Tibet Together. I would like first to thank very warmly Mr. Van Preda and Mr. Thomas Mann for hosting this event. Thank you very much for your support. Um, I think this conference is probably the first one in Europe which uh, focuses on the concept of reciprocity. And uh, the question we have to ask is why have we chosen this uh, issue? Reciprocity is a term which definition and scope are quite broad. When it comes to state to state relations or relations between the EU and China, the concept of reciprocity is traditionally used for economic and trade relations and the access to respective territories for foreign investment and companies. But at ICT, we believe that the definition of reciprocity should be extended to also include fundamental rights and values, such as the right of movement, the right of access, which will be the topic of today's conference, and the freedom of expression. We very much share the opinion of Mr. Uh, Belder, an MEP who will be with us later today, when he says, a critical principle for solid relations between the EU and China is reciprocity, but preferably in all areas, for example, as regards to market access, but equally as regards to freedom of press. Reciprocity fosters mutual trust, establishes a solid foundation for strategic partnerships between the EU and China that is very promising partnership honestly deserves. At a time of growing influence of China in Europe in many different fields and ways, including in the political field, in the academic field, on media, we believe it is time for EU and its member states to re-evaluate the unbalanced relationship with China and see how a redefined and extended concept of reciprocity could be placed at the center of their bilateral relations, in particular in terms of access to territories. In our understanding, the concept of reciprocity does not imply equality of status. Some might say that since Chinese citizens can travel, for instance, to Texas or to South of France, US citizens or French citizens should be allowed to travel to Tibet. But the two situations are very different and are not comparable, because Texas or South of France are legitimate parts of the US and French territories, whereas Tibet is an occupied country administered by China. And this, is, uh, this makes it even more important to have access to Tibet because of the heightened potential for abuse. ICT had the opportunity to discuss the issue of reciprocity with members of parliament in different countries, in France, in the UK and others, and we witnessed a lot of interest and genuine um, openness to our suggestions and ideas. And we believe and we hope that parliaments in Europe will be inspired by the ongoing development at the US Congress and will take some initiatives to put this issue on top of their political agenda. So today we will hear uh, many distinguished speakers who will contribute to the topic and the discussion into two panels. So I'm very happy to have your presence also today. Um, the discussion will be led by uh, Greg Bruno, a journalist and writer, who is, uh, we are very grateful for him to be here with us. And he has spent many years in living in and writing about China, Tibet and the exiled Tibetan community. And he's also the author of a book called Blessing from Beijing Inside China's Soft Power War on Tibet. So I would like to pass the floor now to our first speaker today for some opening remarks, Mr. Dan Predat, the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on Human Rights and a very uh, ad active supporter of Tibet. Thank you, Mr. Preda. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you um, uh, all for attending today's uh, conference uh, on this very important issue, the uh, access to Tibet. Uh, I would like to uh, thank also my colleague uh, Thomas Mann and representatives of the International Campaign for Tibet for organizing uh, this uh, discussion. Um, 
And uh, let me uh, do a few remarks uh, by way of introduction. I don't want to take uh, too, too much of our time. I think it's better to uh, hear from our uh, guests. But let me say that there are in the European Parliament uh, many supporters of the Tibetans, and they are fight for freedom, and I'm proud to be uh, one of them. Uh, my involvement in the Foreign Affairs Committee as uh, the coordinator of my political group, the EPP, and my position um, of first vice chair of uh, the subcommittee on human rights allow me to engage actively on the Tibetan issue uh, whenever I can. Uh, we have been following closely China's human rights abuses in the recent years, and it is true to say that there uh, has been a dramatic deterioration of the respect for human rights in China, affecting uh, the Tibetans, but also uh, Christians, Uyghurs, Falun Gong, and so many others. In the recent report that has been adopted in September 2018, so two months ago, on EU-China relations, the European Parliament condemned once again the worsening of the humanitarian situation in Tibet and we put the focus on several key points. Uh, let me uh, uh, say a few words about these points. The resumption of the dialogue between the Chinese authorities and the representatives of the uh, Tibetan people. Uh, this is the, the first point. And let me remind that while the last round of peace talks to place in 2010, Beijing does not seem to be ready to resume these talks. Moreover, the objective of the Chinese government to reduce the influence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama seems um, uh, very clear. I believe that there is no other option but dialogue, and we need to keep calling the government um, Republic of China to re-enter into a dialogue with the Tibetans urgently. I say urgently because unfortunately too often the Tibetan crisis is not considered as urgent because of um, uh, so many open conflicts that the EU has to deal with in its neighborhood. An inclusive dialogue would be the best chance to solve the crisis peacefully in Tibet. The second element in China's repressive policy threatening the very identity, culture, religion, and language of Tibet. Not <coughs> allowing Tibetans to gather, to pray, to exercise their freedom of thought and speech are violations of basic human rights that should not be tolerated. We cannot hope for stability if there is no respect for human rights. The government of the Public Republic of China needs to realize that as restricted as a policy can be, it will never be able to kill the hope for freedom of an entire people. The third uh, point we uh, mentioned in the recent report uh, is uh, about the restrictions on freedom of movement, also a key problem that should be addressed. During my visit to the delegation for the European Parliament to Nepal uh, three years ago, I had the chance to visit the UNHCR-run Tibetan Reception Center and to meet with a few Tibetans that uh, were lucky enough to get there. During the last few years, the number of Tibetan refugees in Nepal has collapsed. Uh, until 2018, uh, 2008, about 2,000 of them were able to cross the border each year, and now there are around 80 or less. The reason is simple. China is preventing refugees from reaching the border. Finally, our report from September, called on Chinese authorities to give EU diplomats, journalists, and citizens unfettered access to Tibet in reciprocity to the free and open access to the entire territories of the EU member states that Chinese travelers enjoy. It urged, moreover, the Chinese authorities to allow independent observers, including the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, to access Tibet. This is where the principle of reciprocity should come in. The European Union should not tolerate an unilateral approach. On the contrary, we have to refer to the reciprocity as a key principle in terms of our bilateral relations with, uh, with China. I think that in this uh, path towards a solution, our first priority should be to link Tibet with the other aspects of our relationship with the Public Republic of China. There is a strong desire from China to cooperate internationally on a wide range of issues 
from counter-terrorist integration into global economic and financial capital systems. Th this desire provides us with opportunities to get our message out. We have been using and investing in quiet diplomacy <coughs> for too long, and we need to admit that it failed. We did believe that this quiet diplomacy would allow us to achieve some progress regarding the human rights situation in Tibet. It is time to change the method and to publicly condemn the policies of the Chinese government towards the Tibetans and engage in a stronger public diplomacy on human rights issues. The introduction of the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act by the members of Congress in the United States is a positive example that should be followed. At the EU level, we also need to put Tibet on every agenda of the EU-China Human Rights Dialogue so we can make China accountable for the non-respect of its international human rights obligations and take the issue of access into consideration when discussing the EU-China visa facilitation agreement. <coughs> Finally, I think we need to use the anniversary of 60, 60th anniversary of the Dalai Lama's exile in order to send a strong message to the Chinese authorities. Again, thank you for joining our conference today and I'm looking forward to listening to our speakers. Thank you, Mr. Preda. I think we heard very uh, concrete uh, recommendations and suggestions also towards the EU institutions and their uh, quiet diplomacy, which is not uh, always very effective. Um, the, um, the next speaker is uh, well known by, by all of you, certainly. It's Mr. Thomas Mann. He's uh, the champion of Tibet uh, within the European Parliament since uh, several mandates now, and he is a uh, chair of the Tibet Interest Group, uh, which is a uh, um, a cross-party group meeting on a monthly basis to discuss Tibet and push for uh, common initiative and, and actions. So we are grateful for his support and I pass him the floor. Thank you very much, Vincent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the European Parliament. Uh, with pleasure, I can uh, have the Christian on my side. Very often we are fighting together. Also we visit together in Nepal. And of course, Kaysan Gyatsing, a very uh, experienced friend. And uh, of course, others like Matteo Mikachi or uh, Kai or Thierry Jampa or whoever is there. Ah, this is Ari Malos also. So we know each other well. And of course, my dear colleagues in the first row here, very active fighters for Tibet and Noda. Um, before I start my statement, I should uh, tell you some words about the passing of uh, one of our dearest friends, Lodi Gyali. He was a great Tibetan. He was a skilled diplomat and he passed away after a lifetime of dedication and servitude to the Tibetan people. From a very young age, Lodi's life was strongly impacted by the Chinese occupation of Tibet, disrupting his monastic education and leading him to pursue the fight for Tibetan freedom. In all stages of his life, he fought for the Tibetan cause, starting off as a journalist, then the founder of the Tibetan Youth Congress, and later a member of the Kasha. Ludi always gave his voice to the Tibetan people. And while this is through his whole life, he transitioned from the idea of resisting Chinese oppression to that of the Dalai Lama's really approach. His desire for Tibetan freedom always stood strong. Lodi, he built and maintained strong and lasting diplomatic ties with the United States, even entered negotiations with the Republic of China, and on his side was Kezan Yeltsin. Several times we met in Germany, as well as uh, in the European Parliament, where we had uh, fruitful discussions. I could always rely on his words, and we also we are very sad uh, about this um, passing. Not only the Tibetans, they have lost a great compatriot and a key figure in the pursuit of Tibetan freedom and human rights. In the name of the Tibet Interest Group and all our believers, our thoughts are with his wife, his uh, sibling, as well as the children and grandchildren. We always keep him in our thoughts. I think later on we have the opportunity to sign because there is a picture of that. So now come uh, to this, our Congress. We have gathered today in order to discuss a topic of utmost importance, 
in uh, regard to the relations between China and the European Union, the free access to Tibet and the principle of reciprocity. As you know, the Tibet Interest Group does the utmost to raise awareness about urgent developments. We support the debating case by informing MEPs, the Council and the European Commission, and of course the public about torture and illegal imprisonment. We invite high-ranking experts from all over the world, Tibetan prisoners, nuns and monks, people from the media, professors, as well as refugees, to inform about the political situation, the environment and the deficits of human rights. In January 2018, in this year, there was a conference, the Middle Way Approach, of the only viable solution for Tibet, joined by Dr. Lubsan Sangai, president of uh, CTA. The evening before, Lubsan joined our TIG meeting to discuss with the members about the ongoing human rights violations in Tibet. On the 10th of March, people came together worldwide to demonstrate the solidarity with the Tibetan people. I uh, participated in the Europe Rally for Tibet in Geneva, also you were there. It was a powerful demonstration with strong speeches in front of 3,500 people and of course in front of the Human Rights Council in Geneva. And then during an uh, MEP mission to the Ramsala, we met His Holiness on a very important day, the 9th of May, the Europe Day. Uh, he emphasized the role of the European Union as an important voice for human rights. In the world, he discussed uh, the critical developments, of course, of the right-wing movements in many, many member states of the <coughs> Union. His Holiness, he expressed his gratitude for our ongoing support in the European Parliament. We also met the Sikyon, several institutes, the members of the Parliament in exile, and of course, very sad moments, young refugees who just now arrived recently after many weeks of pain and suffering. On the 29th of August, I could host a photo exhibition in the Parliament, Tibetan <coughs> in the Aspora, a success story, with the Agata Abatina Durzo from Italy. She received several photo awards. It was a great exhibition for one week here in the European Parliament. On the 18th of October, there was a demonstration in Brussels on the occasion of the 12th ASEM summit, together with 200 50 Tibetans and Uyghurs, we um, were there, we expressed our solidarity with the Tibetan people, not far away <coughs> from the European Commission. Today, we will discuss the notion of reciprocity and the free access for Tibet as demonstrated in several resolutions in the European Parliament. Restrictions on human rights, they have worsened the situation for the Tibetans in the last years and the Chinese government. New suppression laws have been adopted. And the biggest strategy is the self immolation of more than 150 Tibetans, monks and nuns. Under the pretext of security and stability, Chinese authority, they are always curtailing human rights. Chinese government created an environment of fear where any non-violent protest is being criminalized. As indicated in the last report on the state of the EU China, my colleague Bas Bella, later on he will arrive, we urge uh, China to give EU diplomats and journalists and citizens unrestricted access to Tibet in reciprocity to the free and open access to the entire territories. Chinese authorities must allow Tibetans and Tibetans to travel freely and to respect their right to freedom of movement. We also urge to allow independent observers to access Tibet. EU institutions must make the sure a central point of the EU-China Visa Facilitation Agreement. As president of the Tibet Interest Group of the European Parliament, I emphasize that today's conference is of utmost importance. Thank you very much and Toshi Lide. Thank you, thank you very much, Thomas, for your time and, and supporting and inspiring words, um, uh, and your tribute also to uh, Rudy uh, Gyari. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Kelsen Gelsen. He is a former special representative of His Holiness Dalai Lama in Europe, and from 2002 to 2010, 
He was also an envoy of His Holiness the Dalai Lama together with Ludi Gary, entrusted with the responsibility to, of conducting the dialogue with the Chinese leadership. And they both engaged in nine rounds of talks, of formal discussion, and one informal meeting with the representative of Chinese leadership. The international campaign for Tibet is deeply saddened by the passing away on October 29 of Lodi Gary, the retired special envoy of His Holiness, senior <coughs> official of the Central Administration, Tibetan Central Administration, and executive chairman of our organization. Mr. Gary was a seasoned and skilled diplomat who spent the majority of his professional career working directly for and on, of, on behalf of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He was an impassionate advocate for the Tibetan people, for universal human rights, and for global democratic reforms. Many of you in the European Parliament knew him, and some of you were close to him and even friends. And ICT believed that it was the right time and occasion, uh, this conference at the heart of EU institutions, to uh, commemorate his uh, work and life. And indeed, there is a condolence book that is. Uh, at the entrance of the room, if you wish to leave a message. So, this being said, I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Kelsen Gatman. Thank you. Dear Vincent, honorable members of parliament, and ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the organizer and host of this conference for inviting me. And it is great to be back again to the European Parliament after my retirement in 2016. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has always been a great admirer and supporter of the European Union. He has been calling for the need in other parts of the world to emulate the spirit of international cooperation and union of this supranational body in order to prevent violent conflict and to secure peace. Consequently, in line with this thinking, in, two, in 1988, he decided on purpose to choose the European Parliament in Strasbourg as the appropriate venue to present his first formal proposal on the issue of Tibet uh, to be negotiated with the Chinese leadership that does not call for the separation and independence of Tibet. This historic moment also marks the beginning of the EU's sustained engagement on the issue of Tibet. The Belgian official entrusted with the task of leading the drafting team of this historic proposal was Jari Roger Jensen. The assignment of this seminal task in the freedom struggle of the Tibetan people to Jari Rinpoche as he is known with great respect among Tibetans, highlights the towering and leading role that Jari Rinpoche played in advancing the just cause of the Tibetan people internationally and in reaching out to the Chinese leadership in the pursuit of a negotiated resolution to the issue of Tibet. Rodi, as Western friends called him with great affection and admiration, died three weeks ago on 29th October 2018. He was 69 years old. And Lodi had also here in Europe many friends among parliamentarians, diplomats, and political leaders. Lodi Jari dedicated his <coughs> entire life to the service of his foreign federal Lama and the Tibetan people, occupying many important leading positions within the Tibet movement. He was a most experienced, savvy, and skilled Tibetan diplomat, championing with deep conviction and power of persuasion the legitimate, and the legitimate rights and aspirations of his people at the highest level of the international political arena. He was not only gifted with natural, natural political talent and interest, but was also the most hard-working and purposeful and resourceful operating Tibetan colleague I have ever known in my over 30 years of service. His passing is an irreplaceable loss for the Tibetan movement, and I personally lost a very dear friend 
and ever reliable and dependable comrade, and a great source of inspiration in the enduring and difficult coming quest for freedom and dignity of our people. Among the output of grief, gratitude, and tributes from people across the world after his demise, Nancy Pelosi, the House Democratic, Democratic leader and most likely the speaker of the new U.S. Congress, expressed, among others, as follows. The world has lost an extraordinary champion for the Tibetan people. Lodi worked relentlessly to secure a better future for Tibet and built deep support for the Tibetan cause throughout America and around the world. Members of Congress on both sides of the aisles benefited from Lodi's insight and wisdom. Lodi's legacy is ours to continue through action and advocacy. The situation in Tibet is a challenge to the conscience of the world. If we do not speak out for human rights in Tibet and in China because of commercial interests, then we lose all moral authority to talk about human rights in any other place in the world. End of the quote. Against this background, this conference on Tibet, discussing ways and means to better promote and protect human rights of the Tibetan people, can also be seen as honoring Lodi Jaris inspiring legacy. This conference on access to Tibet and the practice of reciprocity is taking place at a time when China is marking the 40th anniversary of Deng Xiaoping's launch of reform and opening up policy. This new direction in late 1978 unleashed immense changes that resulted in China's rise from the wreckage of the, of the Cultural Revolution to the world's second biggest economy. The unprecedented transformation of China has been made possible to a large extent also by the international community that warmly embraced and welcomed the new direction China was taking. Today, however, China is facing a vastly different international environment. There is more skepticism, suspicion, even anxiety and fear among many countries concerning China. What is of more importance is that there seems to be a lot of discussions, assessments and analysis going on in China about its past and future course in the light of this anniversary. China, stood, China seems to be once again at a time of crossroads. Which direction China decides to take will also depend to a great extent again on the attitude and policies of the members of the international community. In this context, the practice, practice of reciprocity in international relations is an important factor, but it is of equal critical importance to ensure that reciprocity in bilateral and multilateral relations does not confine only to market access, trade, trade balance, or commercial trade-offs. As a matter of fact, mutual trust is an indis indispensable prerequisite for stable, peaceful, and mutually beneficial relations among states. This is just common sense and the lessons of history. Key to ensuring trust is the adherence to international principles and norms by member states, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, etc. The assumption of Western democracies that economic development and prosperity in China will eventually lead to greater openness and liberalization of the political system has proven to be a fallacy in visual thinking. Against this background, it is of crucial importance now to hold China accountable for a brutal suppression of the Tibetan and Uyghur people and other minorities and religious groups in China, as well as of Chinese human rights defenders and democracy activists. 
the European Union, as a highly respected international body, can take the lead in, in, in ensuring China's adherence to and compliance with the provisions of international legal instruments on human rights. By adopting a new and more robust, coherent and unified policy, aiming to encourage and ensure that China becomes a responsible, responsive and respected member of the international community is also the way to better promote and pr protect human rights in Tibet as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine Gershon, for your uh, very kind words. And, and we knew, uh, we know how uh, close you were to Lodi Gary. Uh, and, uh, and your speech reminds us also how um, a talented uh, diplomat you are still, even if you are not active uh, today anymore. Um, so this introduction part uh, is now um, over. We will uh, start with the two panel session. I will invite the uh, uh, moderator and the uh, first panelist to co moderate. We will switch. Uh, the <coughs> Table names at uh, so like three minutes and then we'll go over and we'll continue. Thank you. The name tags are here. Okay. So, Greg, you're still here. Sure. Thank you very much um, for the uh, first introductions, and um, thank you for all of you in uh, the gallery for being here. I have the dubious distinction and honor of trying to keep time, um, which I will uh, try to do as judiciously as possible. Um, but we have lots to cover. So let's get right to the conversation. As, as we just heard, we're here to discuss the issue of access to Tibet, an issue that has challenged leaders, including Chinese emperors, for centuries. Western colonialists, contemporary Chinese leaders, uh, and many others have asked themselves the question of what access to Tibet means. But it no longer is a question just of mysticism or political patronage. Rather, today, access is something much more fundamental. Over the last decade, China has weaponized access to, to the Tibetan Plateau, controlling every aspect of visitors' stay while closing the traditional trade and migration routes that gave Tibetans direct access to their religious leader, the Dalai Lama. For decades after the Dalai Lama left Tibet in 1959, thousands of Tibetans every year left either for short religious pilgrimages or to start anew in India or the West. Many also returned. But in 2008, amid protests in Tibet, and as the Olympic torch wound its way to Beijing, China locked down, one of the, uh, locked down the once poorest land border. Tibet has today become a virtual prison for Tibetans inside Tibet, and a nearly impenetrable fortress for Western observers. My name is Greg Bruno. I'm an editor with uh, Project Syndicate, the global syndication opinion service based in the Czech Republic. For the purpose of this conversation, I'm also the author of a book on the Tibetan diaspora, as you just heard, 
Blessings from Beijing. I, I never take, I miss an opportunity to plug my book, so I'll do it now. Um, <laughs> blessings from Beijing. Right audience. Exactly. Inside China's Soft Power War on Tibet, which looks at, among other things, the impact of China's post-2008 foreign policy on Tibetans outside of Tibet. But today, we're here to discuss the situation inside the Tibet. Uh, so without any further ado, let's get right to that conversation. And let me first introduce my fellow panelists. To my left, Matteo Makachi, who's president of the International Campaign for Tibet. He joined ICT in December 2013. Before that, he served as the Italian, in the Italian parliament as a member of the Italian Chamber of Deputies on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Matteo has, was also elected chairperson of the Italian Parliamentary Intergroup for Tibet, a position he held throughout his tenure in Parliament. To his left, Ursula Gauthier is a French journalist from Lobes. She's a specialist in East Asia, the Middle East, international relations, religion, and psychology. I understand. Ursula is, was also the 2002 recipient of the Louis Hatchet Prize. And she was a correspondent in China for Lobes from 2009 to 2015. Her press credentials were not renewed after publication of an article that criticized China's policies towards its Muslim minorities. And she left China at the end of 2015. Uh, and to her left is Vero de Vos, a Belgian, close, sorry. <laughs> uh, she's a Belgian journalist with VRT, a uh, Flemish radio station. She has expertise in Asia, and in October 2015, if I have it correct, she traveled to Tibet on a Chinese-organized visit, which we'll hear about. And finally, uh, Manfred Novak is former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. He's not with us personally, but we'll hear a, a message from him uh, about his fact-finding missions. So let me first turn it over to you, Matteo. I know you have uh, some statements uh, that you've prepared. But first, if you could just walk us through the situation regarding access to Tibet for Westerners, politicians, diplomats, uh, and give us an overview of the, the strategy or the question of reciprocity that we're here to discuss. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Greg, and thank you all for coming. Um, Christian, Thomas, uh, Shabbat, was left, and the other members of parliament uh, who have hosted are here today. We're very grateful for the opportunity. And also, let me say just a few words because I was just in India with my colleague, uh, Tseni Jampa. We were there uh, to attend the, the funeral ceremonies for, for Lord Yari. So we were in Dehradun in one of the Tibetan settlements in exile, uh, where um, a monastery uh, of the school to which Lord Yadi belonged organized a very elaborated ceremony uh, for his passing. And I could uh, attest by the presence of you know, foreign friends uh, and local uh, Tibetan community leaders the, the impact that Lodi has had on, uh, on our Tibet movement and overall uh, in the Tibetan community. So as uh, he has been uh, the executive chairman of the International Campaign for Tibet and one of his uh, first president, uh, uh, we really mourn his passing away and uh, we will continue as much as we can uh, to, to pursue his legacy, to, to continue the fight for the freedom of the Tibetan people. Um, and then to come to the, to the issue that we are discussing today, um, I'm really pleased that we can have this conversation to start uh, discussing what is the impact not only uh, uh, of this issue of reciprocity specifically on Tibet, but really what is the broader relationship with China that you know, European Union countries or the United States, Australia, Canada will have with China in, in the future. Um, and the situation, to come to your question, is uh, it's very clear. Um, the policies of the Chinese government in Tibet continue to be oppressive. They have been, uh, they have invaded Tibet 70 years ago. The Dalai Lama has been in exile almost 60 years ago. And in 2008, uh, the largest demonstrations of protest happened in Tibet. And since then, the repression has been increasing. Uh, but with the oppression, one essential element that the Chinese uh, government has employed is a policy of complete isolation of Tibet. Repression cannot function unless you have isolation. Because when you have repression, you have reaction, people can speak out, you have public opinion which is involved, and then the international community can respond and take action. The Chinese government has envisioned a system now in which they can assure complete isolation of Tibet. So that would not allow the Tibetan people to really make their voice heard aside. 
And we have seen that clearly since 2008 with the, uh, actually, the taking over of the Tibetan region of a Chinese official, Chen Kuanguo, who is currently moved to uh, Xinjiang. And you might have seen uh, over the last few months the reports coming out from Xinjiang of the mass repression that has been taking place there. Uh, and basically the application of repressive policies that have been tested before in Tibet with a system of mass surveillance uh, which has really reached every sector and angle of, of society. So in order to guarantee isolation, one way has been to block the border with Nepal and only few dozen Tibetans can now reach uh, Nepal uh, from Tibet uh, while you know, a few years ago, uh, several thousands a year were, were able to do that. And the other one is a special system of um, an additional permit which is needed for any foreign visitors that want to visit Tibet. So if you're a foreign visitor, it's not enough, even a tourist. You don't need to be a journalist or a diplomat, but if you want to go to Tibet, you need a special permit. And this special permit is not granted through the usual you know, uh, tourist visa system that they apply at the consulates. It goes through the political um, uh, section of the embassies and then directly uh, to Beijing. So by doing that, uh, the Chinese government has prevented um, uh, you know, the great majority of requests that come uh, from foreign governments. One example, from 2011 to 2015, the State Department requested, the US Embassy in Beijing requested 39 times uh, the opportunity to visit the Tibetan region, only four times they were granted access. Um, the Chinese, uh, the, the Foreign Correspondent Association in Beijing, they issue every year a report in which they explain that it's easier for them to go to North Korea from Beijing uh, than to go to Tibet. And actually in North Korea you have a couple of uh, news outlets who, are, who have correspondents in, in Pyongyang. You don't have anybody in Lhasa. So uh, for uh, us or for anybody who's interested in knowing about the situation in Tibet, we are now in a situation in which the only uh, available sources are the official sources of the Chinese government. And considering that we are talking about a, a government which is run by one party system, where there's no uh, division of power, there's no free press, uh, you can imagine what's the strategy. The strategy is to have the Chinese government propaganda to be the only official source of information for the world. And since 2008, we know that China has gained a lot of political leverage all over the world. So by isolating the information coming out of, uh, of Tibet, by blocking refugees and by blocking access from outside, what they're trying to do is moving from a passive approach, which is to block people from going in or getting out of Tibet, to an offensive approach. And the offensive approach is something that should be worried each of us, because the offensive approach is to take advantage of the liberties and freedoms which are allowed in the European Union, in the United States, in Australia, in Canada, and change the discourse around human rights in China, specifically also in Tibet, but in general in China, in our own society. So what they are trying to do is to prevent democratic institutions, free press, diplomats, to talk about the enforcement of universal human <coughs> rights in China. And this goes beyond Tibet or China. It really wants to undermine the international human rights system, which has been built after the Second World War, and we know all the conventions and the treaties which have been implemented, because uh, with their political leverage and economic leverage, the Chinese government has, are trying to make these rules irrelevant that you can basically have a system that can be economically successful and doesn't need to follow these international standards. So why we want to focus on reciprocity? Because by raising in the bilateral relations the question of reciprocity, actually you can give an opportunity to our governments to call on China to respect these fundamental values. Because the principle of reciprocity, whether it's for freedom of movement, or which is you know, very clear, if the Chinese officials, the Chinese citizens can travel everywhere freely in our countries, why are not our citizens allowed to do the same? Especially if they say that everything is fine in Tibet. They say that Tibetans are happy. There's no civil war, there's no terrorist activity. So why are they not allowed to go there? But think about journalists. Uh, now the Xinhua and the other state-sponsored 
news media from China are opening shops in all capitals of the world, and they are expanding their operations, broadcasting in, their, in our own languages. They are active on Twitter, they are active on all social media, uh, promoting their propaganda. Why is it that the BBC, the CNN, or another Western outlet cannot operate in the Chinese market? They cannot broadcast there. What is the principle there? The principle is to try to take advantage of the freedoms here to spread the propaganda and do not uh, implement these international standards. Uh, so we think that this is an important discussion that we need to have, especially in a moment where multilateral institutions seem to be paralyzed in dealing with China. Uh, we have seen at the United Nations now, China just had uh, the uh, UPR, the Universal Periodic Review of their appliance of universal uh, human rights principle. There has been a discussion, but you know, China, who is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, does not cooperate at all with the Office of the Human Rights, UN Human Rights Commissioner. Uh, there have been dozens of requests from all special rapporteurs to travel to China, to go to Tibet. None has been granted. The last one, I think, it was in the 90s. So um, this is, I think, it's an important uh, uh, conversation that we need to have. And there has been some um, positive movement in the United States Congress. And I'll stop uh, after some words, and maybe you can you know, have a more interactive discussion on this. Uh, because the bipartisan legislation that wants to apply this principle of reciprocity in U.S.-China relations uh, passed the House of Representatives last September, and we are hoping just in the next maybe hours we might know uh, whether the Senate could move forward. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, this is legislation that basically will give the authority to the State Department to identify those Chinese officials. So we are not talking about all Chinese citizens. Nobody wants to block you know, Chinese people from going anywhere. But we are talking about the Chinese officials who are responsible for implementing and uh, crafting those policies. They could be denied access to the United States. And actually, we know what you know, the elites are doing in China. They are you know, sending all their children and they're moving all their capitals, especially in the United States, but also in London and in other places. So we think that uh, what is important here is to send a message, a very clear political message to China that this kind of imbalance and uh, behavior will not be tolerated by democracies unless the principle of reciprocity is, uh, is implemented. And so that I think is, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a short uh, uh, you know, sentence, I think the way we can you know, try to summarize uh, the, the, the discussion and the conversation is really to find ways uh, in which democratic, you know, governments and institutions um, call on China and keep it accountable for uh, the lack of uh, implementation of this principle. Okay, I want to get to the question uh, that you mentioned, the journalistic question and the access for journalists. But before I do, I just want to, to follow up really, really briefly. How applicable do you think the model is that's being used uh, and explored in the United States is to the European context? I think it is. Uh, you, you are all aware about, uh, of the Magnitsky Act, uh, which is this legislation that was you know, first introduced by the United States Congress, uh, you know, championed by Bill Browder, that basically applies these you know, sanctions for people who are responsible for human rights violations that can be there. So basically, this is not a very different concept. The idea is that you try to identify a very clear you know, violation of, you know, internationally and commonly agreed principle. And if you have a government that is not respecting them, you can start to target the, the people who are responsible for this decision and make them the price. Um, I think we have passed uh, internationally the, the, the discussion about embargo or you know broad economic sanctions. This is nothing. It has nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is to really to, 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 to have you know, kind of smart sanctions that can uh, can influence the people uh, who are making those decisions, and actually they can act to change it uh, quite quickly if, if they want. So I think it might take some time to get adjusted to that, but I think what is important is that increasingly, also in Europe, the conversation on reciprocity with China, you know, mainly from the economic and trade 
side, but has come to be of very important attention. And uh, we have seen uh, both in Germany, in France, uh, at the highest level of governments calling uh, for the application of the principle of reciprocity in, in dealing with China. What we are trying to say is that, as we do with the, you know, who's involved in the you know, human rights campaigns, always do that, is to try to move this principle from you know, the economic issues also to rule of law, freedom of information, freedom of movement, because if you do that, it's a very healthy way to have a dialogue also with the Chinese government in which uh, you challenge them not to apply principles which are uh, only common to Western democracy, but actually are internationally accepted mm -hmm. uh, principles and values. So I think that there is a chance to, to go that direction. Right. OK. Um, so I, I want to move to uh, Ursula and look at the question from a journalistic one. The, the type of access that Western journalists currently have in, in China and Tibet. Um, you have a, a pretty interesting uh, and, and remarkable story about some of the reporting that you've, you've done. Tell us a bit about what you saw during your days reporting. You know, on, the, on the margins of the TAR, you visited a number of Tibetan areas. Conditions, um, what's the situation? But also then talk about what happens to, to Western journalists when you cross that kind of you know, that line in China's mind. Yes, what Matteo said is really important because the, China is really trying uh, in order to control what is set inside in our countries about their system. They want to control, in fact, uh, all of our liberties uh, because it's the safest way to be, <coughs> to be in control of what is said about China. But uh, I'm, I'm here to talk about my personal experience on the field as a foreign correspondent. And what I can say is that there is no reciprocity. For instance, when I was sent as a correspondent to China, I had to wait for my accreditation, my visa, the, the journalist visa, for one year and a half. Because they had to, I don't know what, but we had to use many, many different interventions from uh, the, the, our bosses and then they try to, to even uh, have a political intervention in order to get a visa to become a correspondent in China. But when China wants to send correspondents to our countries, there is no limit whatsoever. I don't have the, the exact numbers, but they have a lot, a lot, a lot more of uh, journalists here so-called journalists sometimes, uh, but then, then we have. Uh, the number of foreign correspondents in China is very limited. Um, and also, I want to say also that there is always the problem of renewing the visa. Once a year, this journalist visa has to be reviewed and it's always a very complicated um, process. And every time there is a risk that, that they don't renew it because you wrote something sensitive or something that displeased them. So they will at least tell you, every time I had to renew my visa for the six years I've been there, every time, every year, the policeman would say, you have done illegal things. I said, what illegal things? They said, you have been to, to territories where you're not supposed to go. And then you have to remind the policeman that those territories are open. So, uh, so they try everything to put pressure on the foreign journalists not to do the reports. And also another problem of uh, inexistent reciprocity is that they decide to expel a journalist, and I'm one of them, but there have been many cases recently, who has written something they didn't like. In my case, it was an article about uh, about what was going on in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs, uh, because China used the Paris attacks to say that what's, what, what has happened in, in Xinjiang was exactly the same uh, as uh, what happened in Paris. So my article said, sorry, it's not the same thing. It's very different. And in your case, there is a real uh, crackdown on ordinary people. And that's why you have so much trouble in Xinjiang. So uh, that didn't please them, and that's why they expelled me. Uh, but in my case, uh, sometimes the foreign ministers of our countries, they try 
to at least use this reciprocity uh, element to, to, to obtain that, that, you know, if, if you want to expel one of our journalists, I will expel one of yours. But in my case, it, it wasn't done. And that's why uh, the thing, well, went, all, went uh, smoothly for China. Uh, what I want to say also is the difficulty of access for all those territories. Well, today we know that Xinjiang is basically uh, an open uh, an, uh, a camp. Well, you have uh, more than a million people in the camps. But this is Xinjiang. Tibet is, is a different story. Uh, the TAR, uh, Tibet capital Lhasa, the autonomous region, is uh, more or less, I mean, forbidden, de facto forbidden to foreign journalists. Um, as Matteo said, uh, it was much more, much, it's much easier to go to Pyongyang than to go to Lhasa. And in my case, I went to Pyongyang, I didn't go to Lhasa. Uh, fortunately, I went to Lhasa previously. Uh, I've been to Lhasa before being a journalist on the journalist visa, so I could go there as a tourist. Um, sometimes, and I can say that it was really under very harsh and hard control. In uh, the case of other Tibetan territories, they, they're supposed to be open, so foreign journalists could go to the other <coughs> regions, uh, which are autonomous, but not, not big region, maybe autonomous, um, what is it, Xi'an or some other... Um, <laughs> Uh, administrative <laughs> unit. Uh, so I've been to to Qinghai, which is mostly Tibetan, to Sichuan, half half west of Sichuan is Tibetan, to Gansu, half south of Gansu is Tibetan, and some other places. So in those places, we were supposed to be able to go freely, as in any other place in uh, inland China. But in fact. As soon as you go there, if you don't use very uh, numerous and extensive cunning, you can do nothing. As a journalist, you are followed. Uh, they block you for seeing people, for talking to people. They come and, and take you to interrogatories, to the police stations. They, use, they, they block your time. Recently, uh, one of my friends tried to go to a Tibetan area and uh, he was, as soon as he arrived to the airport, he was followed by so many plainclothes uh, plain policemen that he was obliged to go back to Beijing. He, can, he couldn't do one photo. So it's very complicated to cover what's going on. About the immolations, I can tell you that when more than 150, 156, huh? well, uh, when I was there, we were counting the immolations and we were saying we should go. We should go and see and understand what's going on, why those young people are immolating themselves. But we couldn't. I could go. I, I can say I'm, I'm very proud. I'm one of the two journalists in the world who have seen the families of two immolated people uh, the other journalist and I went together, it's a French journalist from Liberation, we went together and we were able, because he, like me, is, spoke Chinese, we could go and we could find a way to go and find the exact house of the persons who were immolated and we could understand why this happened. We, could, we, we wrote articles, but it's incredible that such a huge phenomenon hasn't been covered adequately. There had, it, it, I mean, two or three articles, really, about, about the families of immolated people. It's, it's a scandal. So uh, this is also the way China <coughs> just, just stops uh, foreign media to, to, to go to the places and to, to cover. Uh, very important stories. Mm. <laughs> can, I, can I just say yeah, one please word? Please. Because I, I think it's important uh, what Ursula just mentioned about the, the, the self emulation Actually, even the Dalai Lama has several times requested some sort of independent investigation. 
to understand the phenomenon. Mm. Um, and so uh, I think this is something that even I think the European Parliament uh, could consider to, to raise again because it comes really to the question of access. But more than that, really, this is a humanitarian, you know, and in a political crisis, which is kept uh, um, from the world. I mean, you you have reports and you know requests to you know, to go to Burma or to, to many other countries when there is you know such events. And I think in the case of Tibet, it's really striking that uh, there hasn't been no one has been allowed to, to make any kind of investigation of this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know we're talking about Western journalism, but I, the, the real scandal that hasn't been covered by Chinese media, um, because in many ways these these acts of complete desperation uh, are directed uh, not necessarily to us, but um, to the situation inside of, inside of Tibet and China. I want to continue on the question of, of access for journalists. I mean, it's getting worse. Um, uh, you know, your experience, Ursula. Um, uh, just this, it continues. Just in August, BuzzFeed's uh, China bureau chief uh, was kicked out for writing uh, on a similar topic. FT's Hong Kong Asia editor um, uh, ha has been um, uh, run out because of his, his association with uh, a conference on a pro independent political party. Uh, what should Western governments be doing um, to, to stand up against this rising kind of tide of, of journalistic illiberalism? Um, is it time to, to start making good on the types of threats that were made in the past, uh, or is, is stronger action needed? What, what do you suggest? I don't believe that our governments are ready to use those, those even to make the threats, just verbally. They, I don't know why, but there is some kind of fear or some kind of timidity. I don't know how to, to describe this. Uh, our governments, by large, are not doing their work. That's what I say every time I write about those topics. So I'm very, uh, I'm very happy today to speak with with MEPs. So that please tell to your governments they have to act, they have to take action, because the journalists they do what their work. It's their job. They can go. They can try to solve the problems and, and do the coverage, but we need the government to take action. Let's continue down the line um, and stick with this question of access. Because it seems to me that access, uh, unless we define it well, uh, it can be very, it can be different things. Um, uh, the access for diplomats and tourists, for journalists, but there's also controlled access. Uh, and Mr. Vaz has experienced that um, uh, quite recently, so interested to hear about that experience. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, first I'd like to say um, I work as a journalist for the Flemish public broadcaster. So we have FTBF on the French side and we have VFT on the Flemish side. And uh, I usually work as a radio journalist, but well, times are changing. So when I went to Tibet, I took the cameraman. I also had an online diary and I made some radio reports. So, how did it happen? Well, it was a day in June, I think, a Monday morning, I got a phone call from the Chinese embassy with the question, would you like to go to Tibet? <laughs> um, the woman calling me was the press person at that time, a young Chinese woman who was very open-minded, had a very good contact with her, she helped me before the visa, I've met her on several occasions. So when she got this invitation from Beijing saying you can send some Belgian journalists, she phoned me. Um, so I said that I answered I'd very much like to go to Tibet. Um, okay, it was a government visit, which of course I understood. Um, we didn't have a real program. Um, I think it was a seven day visit. <coughs> uh, we left with four, or we arrived in Beijing with four Dutch correspondents. Correspondents in China would be invited <coughs> since Belgium doesn't have any correspondents in China at that time. They called people from um, Belgium, so I was there with the journalists from the Soir, and me, so two. So six journalists with a couple of cameramen photographers, so quite a small group. Um, before we left, we went to Beijing. First thing I remember was a lot of banquets, a lot of welcome toasts, 
and a lot of peace tell the truth about Tibet for once, because you Western media are all very biased against us. I remember on the first banquet we had sea slug and some other uh, <laughs> delicacies are familiar with China, so when I see sea, sea slug on my plate, I know, uh-oh, they expect something from me. Otherwise, it would be more tofu, whatever. <laughs> um, so the program was, I think, six days into that. We were going to go to Lhasa, Gyantse, and Shigatse. Uh, as I said, the program, we asked regularly, for, can we have a detailed program, what we're going to see, never arrived. Uh, I think it was just each morning they would tell us today we will go this and this and this and this and we all got on the bus and off we went. Um, what did we see in Lhasa? Well, the tourist spots like Potala Palace, the Yokan Temple. We went to a bilingual school. Uh, we went to a factory and traditional Tibetan medicine. We visited a very happy family in Lhasa uh, who were all by accident members of the Communist Party. Uh, we saw a forestation project, which is very interesting, along the Yadun Zangpo River, so not far from uh, Lhasa. Uh, we went to the Yangdruk Lake, we visited a Tibetan village. In Gyantse, we went to visit, which was interesting, a very old manor that belonged to an aristocratic family. And this was the only place where I have seen a picture of the Dalai Lama on the wall, because they had preserved the house um, well, how the family left it when they moved to India, so the picture was there. Um, and then the slave quarters, so they wanted to show us how did the aristocracy live and how did all the slaves live and, and the difference. It was a propaganda visit, also for Chinese tourists. What else did we visit? A nature protection area, and in Shigatse we visited a tapestry factory, an incense workshop, and the famous Tashi Ministry. Did we have a same program? No, as I said before. They did offer us a very program. As you can see, it was very full. We were out, on, out and about the whole time, so it was not inside having propaganda meetings. No, it was in the bus and then visit and, and be outside. So we did see quite a bit. Um, and it was very clear that the, the goal of the visit was to show us uh, the development in Tibet, thanks to the Chinese government, and the efforts that the Chinese put into the production of culture and nature. So these two things were very much stressed. At every visit we got to speak and interview the people they lined up for us, mostly ordinary Tibetans, who were of course all very positive on the merits of the Communist Party, uh, and testified how their life had improved in recent years. We spoke to some Chinese as well, uh, Chinese tourists, which we met in abundance. Uh, and also, very interestingly, some young party cadres from the party committee in one of the village. Young graduates, Chinese graduates, who had been moved to Tibet and who lived among the villagers to teach them about agriculture, how to improve their livelihoods, and or, as you want to see it, spy and control <laughs> people. Um, what was also very interesting is that most of these interviews that we did were taped and there was especially one uh, Chinese guy from the propaganda department with a long leather coat and glasses which we called Herr Flick after a couple of days um, people who know hello hello uh, and who had a small tape recorder which he would put on the table discreetly and so whatever the Tibetan sold us was all taped. Were we able to speak to ordinary Tibetans? Um, I was, because I prepared this visit. I was happy I got a visa and got into Tibet. And I arranged a meeting with a couple of Tibetans who worked as tour guides in Lhasa. I was able to, because I had some contacts who said, we work with this guy. I contacted them through WhatsApp, um, not through WeChat. Uh, and I met them one evening when I was able, with my cameraman, to leave our hotel discreetly, which means with a small camera, not with a big camera. Uh, I told my host that I was having high altitude sickness, which was actually true, and that I was going to bed early. And so very discreetly, we left our hotel, we met one of the guys, I interviewed two of them, anonymously, of course, um, without having their face and, and, and their name, et 
etc. My Dutch colleagues, who've been in China longer, it was not their first uh, visit to Tibet, decided after dinner one day to go out of the hotel, the four of them, to take a walk and interview some Tibetans in a Tibetan bar, and they were followed by a police car, and of course the whole plan collapsed, and they were not able to speak to any of these people, and then they gave up. Um, apart from the t Tibetans I interviewed uh, on my own and ones that were, you know, put in front of me, I was able to get a lot of information on Tibet, and I'm not sure if you mentioned it, this was October 2015, so about three years ago, in between the lines, because of course, just walking on the street in Lhasa and in Shigadze, you, you see the sheer amount of cameras of police posts on really every corner of the street, police on the roof uh, near the Yokhan temple, security to get in, Chinese don't have to go through the security, Tibetans do. Things like that, like that are obvious just by walking around. Um, but even the arranged interviews were interesting. So I remember going to the bilingual school, which was a model that they wanted to show us because of course most schools are Chinese schools. Um, it was not a bilingual school at all. It was a Chinese school where kids uh, got a couple of hours of Tibetan language courses. And all the other courses, maths and, and, and history, etc., were taught in Chinese. By our standards, that's not bilingual education. I'm from Belgium. We have language issues, so we're very sensitive to this. This is not a bilingual school, very clear. When I asked the director of the school whether any of the kids of recent immigrant Chinese got to learn any Tibetan, he looked at me, <laughs> thinking, what a stupid question is this, and said, in camera, with the camera roll, no, of course not. So that was very clear to me how the language situation is, what's happening. Tibetan kids are getting sinistified, getting lots of Chinese, and, and all the recent Chinese kids coming, immigrant kids, coming to Lhasa are not learning any Tibetan at all. Why should they? Um, at the same school, I interviewed a, a bright Tibetan teacher who taught English there. And she told us how her dream was to visit Britain one day. And, but that she didn't know why, but her demand for a passport to travel had been denied twice already. This was also just a regular interview with someone at the school. Um, Maybe one of the most telling experiences was a visit to the Tashi Lumpo Monastery, where we could finally, after almost a week in Tibet, we could finally interview a monk, because it was promised as before, but then um, it got cancelled. But in the Tashi Lumpo Monastery, we could interview a monk. But when the questions became too sensitive, I was there with very experienced Dutch journalists who all spoke English, who were not scared to ask questions like, uh, do you still honor the Dalai Lama? Of course, at that point, there was a lot of shuffling, and, and one man in a Chinese, a Chinese, Han Chinese in a blue jacket with a mobile phone took over. He started answering those questions. The monk was silenced. When I asked him who he was, there was some nervous shuffling, and then they all admitted that he was the responsible of the management committee of the Chinese Communist Party in the monastery. He lived there, they told me, so the monks only have to care about praying and they could, you know, cover all the rest. So all these experiences taught me, yeah, taught me a lot about the current situation in, in Tibet, even though this was a very guided official propaganda visit. I think our bus even said the Chinese Department of Propaganda, which was on the minibus that drove us around. So that was very clear. Um, Advertising. <laughs> yes, was it all worth it? Well, my last visit, just as Ursula in Tibet, was in 1995. At that point, I traveled there as a tourist for more than one month, alone. Um, after I had just finished two years of teaching in China, so I, I, I had been living in China. Of course, after exactly 20 years, the difference was enormous. Once, on one side, of course, the development, the enormous development in Tibet, so all the roads, etc., etc., but also the way uh, how the people are now, and that was not yet the case in '95, completely controlled. How the party has complete control over the life of the Tibetan 
people, and also the way in which Tibetans are forced to give up their distinct identity, their language, their culture. They have to become Chinese citizens who honor the motherland. And the, the, the literal text I could see in one of the English textbooks, which the students were studying while we were visiting the bilingual school. Um, was it worth it? Again, I prepared this visit very well. So I knew before what did I have to look for. I had some interviews prepared. I, I was knowledgeable. I can imagine if you travel there as a journalist, not knowing, not knowing a lot about China, never having been into Tibet, you can get a very positive picture and think, wow, this is actually, people are very happy and they're very, uh, yeah, the Chinese are managing, managing this very well. Another point I would like to mention, and that's something Matteo also said, uh, and echoes of the controls I saw there and the way that Han party officials go and live among the people um, to control what they think and what they say, I think we can hear in Xinjiang today. And of course, it's not a coincidence that the man who was party secretary of Tibet in 2015 when I was there, Chen Pangwo, is now the party secretary of Xinjiang. So that's also interesting to see that being copied. Yeah. <coughs> is this a preferred way to report in China? Of course not. Um, but for me, it was the only way to actually be in Tibet after 20 years, see the changes. I can also testify, just like Ursula, that it's getting harder and harder to visit China. I have to apply for a visa every time. I'm not a foreign correspondent, so every time I want to go to China, I have to apply to the visa. The documents they ask me, you know, the pile gets longer and longer, the time gets longer and longer. And even for official events as the party congress last year in October, uh, me and my colleague, we were there too, we had to change our flights because our visa was not ready in time, even for a very official um, reporting trip like that. So it's getting harder and harder. This year, we also got the offer to travel to Xinjiang on one of these uh, company trips. I have declined. One of the reasons was that I didn't have the time, but I think knowing what's happening at the moment in Xinjiang, with more than one million people in re-education camps, I just couldn't go and report on the development in Xinjiang, the Belt and Road project, the happy people in Xinjiang, that I think it was just not, I could not, um, how to say, uh, do this. I, I think it was, as a journalist, I couldn't do this. <coughs> the last thing I would like to say, that it's a very thin line, as Ursula says, to, to work as a journalist on China. I mean, at the state, of course I want to keep my contacts with the Chinese embassy. I would like to go back to China. I get more and more, um, how to say, phone calls, text messages from people at the Chinese embassy commenting on my work. I've never had this before. In the last year, I've had one message <coughs> asking me why I got, went to interview Lop San Sange, uh, who was here in Brussels in January. I said, oh, it's my boss, who told me I had to go and interview this person. And then uh, last week, I met some from the Chinese embassy who told me that they were very dissatisfied with my work on the Human Rights Watch report on Xinjiang. I went on TV to talk about this. So, yeah, even here, I'm not in China, I'm here in Belgium. Mm -hmm. I get more and more comments from China, from the official representation, on my work as a journalist. So, it's not going in the right direction. That's how I want to go. Um, well, I think you've covered uh, many uh, of the questions very succinctly that, that what I would have asked. Um, uh, but in presenting kind of this, this, this perfect quandary for journalists seeking access, to China to cover these issues, um, because with that access comes um, whatever the dish you had. Uh, <laughs> I forgot what it was. Um, um, but yes, so um, I will hold the questions for the audience uh, in one minute. We have uh, a brief video that we're going to play from um, uh, Mr. Masha Novak, um, and it continues on this theme of access and some of the challenges that come with access. He's going to recall his uh, fact-finding visits in 2005. Dear members of the European Parliament and participants in the conference on access to Tibet, I'm very, very sorry that I am not able to join you in person. 
at a conference uh, which is dealing with access of international monitoring mechanisms to Tibet. I had myself uh, two experiences in the 1990s. Uh, the International Commission of Jurists, of whom I have been a, a member for many years, conducted another uh, investigation into the situation in Tibet, the human rights situation and the rule of law. Um, and I was uh, invited uh, to carry out the mission together uh, with Christa Meindersma from uh, the ICJ section in the Netherlands and Reed Brody, who was former uh, Deputy Secretary General. We did it together and uh, at least five times the International Commission of Jurists requested the government of uh, China in between um, 1993 and 1996 to get permission for a direct access to China and in particular Tibet. However, uh, at the end, um, the official response was that such a visit would not be opportune. We nevertheless, of course, investigated. We had to go to um, India, primarily New Delhi, and then also Dharamsala, where there is the seat of the exile government. Um, of the Tibetans. Uh, we visited the Dalai Lama and had a long uh, discussion with him and uh, other um, representatives of the exile government. But of course, we based ourselves primarily on uh, interviews with refugees who had come over uh, from Tibet to India. And we finally published uh, this book in 1997, Tibet, Human Rights and the Rule of Law. Uh, which uh, analyzed uh, many different um, human rights violations, starting with the right of peoples to self-determination, uh, but of course also freedom of movement and uh, um, arbitrary detention, summary executions and also torture. My second experience uh, was when I have been appointed as UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, uh, between 2004 and 2010. I wanted to select uh, many different countries from all regions and I approached the Chinese government very quickly. I should say it took almost 10 years since my pre-predecessor, Sir Nigel Rodley, had first started in 1995 to ask the Chinese government for an official invitation. Uh, my predecessor, Theo van Boven, uh, also continued the no negotiations. And when I was appointed in 2004, in October, I immediately started negotiations. And for some reasons, the Chinese government very quickly actually gave in and they said, yes, I am welcome to conduct an official fact-finding mission in October or November and December uh, of uh, 2005. And I made it clear from the very beginning that in addition to Beijing and other areas, I wanted to visit the two autonomous regions of Tibet on the one hand and Xinjiang um, on the other hand. I should say I was able to carry out the mission in accordance with my terms of reference, which also means unannounced visits to places of detention and confidential interviews with uh, all kind of witnesses, but in particular also detainees. However, my method was a little bit changed as the Chinese government insisted that a delegation from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs should actually accompany me in those visits. So at the end we were telling them in the morning to which prison or other detention facility we would go. And um, <clears throat> so it was not totally unannounced. But my right to speak in private with all Titanese of my own choice was respected by the government. Now, in Tibet, we uh, visited on the one hand uh, the, the Lhasa prison number one, but then uh, the, the famous prison Trapchi, where many of the political Titanese uh, have been held and uh, also, of course, Tibetan uh, monks and nuns. However, when I went to Drapchi, uh, I had a long list of about 10 or more 
persons whom I wanted to see. And whenever I asked them, uh, I would like to see this person, it took quite some time and then they said, no, they have been transferred, they have been released actually, they said, um, in spring 2005. And then I got, of course, more and more suspicious. I said, but can you tell me where those persons are now? And then finally it turned out that in April they had opened another prison, Kujui prison, which uh, we didn't know before, and we haven't been told. So that was one of the maneuvers of the Chinese government. We asked them always before, what are, give us a list of all the prisons, and this was not included. So we lost a lot of time, and finally uh, we went also to uh, Kujui uh, prison, and we could speak some of those political prisoners uh, that I wanted to see, but of course we had uh, strong time constraints. But with those whom I was speaking, I got a lot of information about the prison conditions. Actually, many people said the Kujui prison, although it was new, uh, was worse in terms of food, in terms of extreme temperatures, etc., than the very well-known but also infamous Trapchi prison. So that was, I finally reported uh, in public to the Human Rights Council of the United Nations and the General Assembly um, my visit to China. It was, my report was fairly critical. I said there was widespread torture in the country and also criticized the prison conditions, uh, but in particular in relation to political prisoners like Tibetan monks and nuns. And I also criticized the very strong emphasis of the Chinese government on re-education, not only in re-education through labor camps, but also in all the prisons. Uh, also after you have been sentenced, uh, they still wanted to change you, and I called it, was in some instances I called this brainwashing, because if you finally said, okay, I, I see that I have done something wrong and I admit that I have committed this, this kind of crimes and very often it is only uh, having a post of the Dalai Lama or long live the Dalai Lama was already enough for a long term prison sentence. Um, and I felt that I met quite a number of persons who actually have been broken in their resistance uh, and that is what I call brainwashing. Nevertheless, I kept fairly good diplomatic relations to the government of the PRC. Uh, they, they never really, they were not happy with the report, they reacted, but they never said that the whole report was actually uh, not professionally done, uh, etc. Um, now I know that uh, in retrospective this was a very important mission because no other special rapporteur on torture or similar special procedures of the United Nations Human Rights Council were allowed uh, to visit uh, China. They became much more selective but also more self-assured in their policies towards the United Nations but also towards the European Union. I was long term involved in the bilateral dialogue uh, between the European Union and China and I also even organized uh, myself an academic seminar in the context of this dialogue in Beijing and at that time it was still easier uh, to get some kind of concessions from the Chinese government also in response to my recommendations as Special Rapporteur on Torture. Uh, there were certain um, effects and certain measures being taken by the Chinese government. I know that to influence the government today is uh, much more difficult and that brings me to the last point of reciprocity. Um, I do not think that this type of reciprocity by restricting the access of Chinese or Tibetan officials uh, to the European Union in response to restricting the access of human rights investigators to Tibet, that this would have a strong impact and open up Tibet. I think still that an open dialogue uh, with the Chinese government might be, in my opinion, the more fruitful and the more effective way of trying 
to uh, facilitate access to China and access to Tibet. I thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very interesting conference with clear outcomes and recommendations. Thank you. We have some time for some questions. Uh, I'll throw the first one out, but it, we'll then take some. Uh, so I'm going to throw away a kind of rhetorical one. But one thing that uh, the special rapporteur did not mention is that after his visit, some Tibetans um, that he talked with were maltreated and held in isolation. Um, so a question as we're collecting from the audience for all of, uh, the panelists, for, for all the panelists to consider, when we're crafting policies and asking for access, how do we ensure that we're not further endangering uh, those that we're engaging with? That's my rhetorical question. Uh, questions from the audience, we have about 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I saw you first. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask Mateo about the actual number of fish. Can you put the microphone? I think it's maybe better. Okay, sorry. Um, hi, my name is Pamela Tenzin. Um, I wanted to ask Mateo about the um, mechanics, or at least the numbers of officials that would be on the list of um, sanctioned um, people to travel to the US, in your example. Yeah, so um, actually in the initial draft of the legislation that was introduced in the US Congress, there was a list of positions, both you know, on the central level and also at the county level. But during the legislative process, the, the House of Representatives decided to change the legislation. And now, uh, if the legislation is passed and signed into law, they, there is a requirement to the State Department to identify within six months a list of Chinese officials that they believe are responsible for blocking access to Tibet. So in this way, the one, you know, basically the government will have a little bit more flexibility and that, that, I think, also goes back to the final point of you know, Manfred Novak. Uh, this legislation doesn't want to prevent dialogue with the Chinese authorities. Actually, it's a form of dialogue. If you pass a resolution, if you pass legislation, you want to engage. So you are making a case and you are addressing you know, the, the, the other part with some concerns that you have. Uh, and and, the, and our goal is not really to prevent you know, Chinese officials from coming here. The goal is to open up Tibet. So there's no like a punitive you know, approach on this legislation. It's, it's quite the opposite. It's a way to, to show them a concern which is you know, based on uh, agreed international standards and that needs, needs to change. But to, to the point that you're making, um, so there is not a, a complete list. And uh, as with all legislation that deal with sanctions, there is always also a national security waiver that the government can uh, apply in case they want to. Uh, for example, there is a reference to the United Nations conventions that will you know, represent an exception granting these officials if they have to travel to the UN in New York for you know, business, etc. Okay. Did you have a question? I think it's up there. Close on. Oh. Yes. Sorry, I don't stay. My name is Carmela. I've got a question to the two journalists. Thank you, uh, first of all, for for being here today and giving your, your testimony and your experiences you know, and offering it to, you, to us. I, I just want to uh, point out one particular example uh, of reprisals against sources of journalists that probably also were known to you in the case of Tibetan Tashi Manchu, who, as, as we know, has, has given an interview to the New York Times in 2015. He got uh, arrested immediately after that and um, uh, was detained and got a sentence in 2018 to or five years for inciting separatism. And the core evidence as we learned for, uh, in his case, used by the Chinese authorities, was this video that was shot 
by the uh, New York Times. So I think it's this not only from our perspective, not only a, a message to to the Tibetans not to to uh, go public on their uh, dissent, but also a message to the New York Times <coughs> and to all of you, in fact. So I just want to reiterate the, the question that has been touched on by Greg Bruno. How, how do you deal with it? Or how, what would you suggest to your colleagues? Um, yes, this is a big concern for all the journalists who work there. Because be it in, in the minority areas or in <coughs> inland China, it's the same. If you speak to the foreign press, you can have big trouble. So, <laughs> personally, how did I do this? When I went to minority areas, I never accepted an open face testimony. Even though the person would tell me, please, please, I want to testify, I would say no. No. I, I take your testimony, but I will cover your name. I will not use your name. Uh, so, uh, because I know what will happen to you. So I won't do it. I won't be the, you know, the canal by which you, you, you have big trouble. In inland China, it's different. Because sometimes, uh, I mean, the people who are ready to talk, to say there's, for instance, land grab situation, people who have, who have lost their house, their, their land, sometimes their children being killed or something, they want to testify in their name with an open face. And in that case, um, well, what I, do, I did, I, I told them very precisely what was waiting them. And uh, I told them, do you still want to do this? And if they said yes, and in that case, I would say, OK. You know the, the odds. You know what your, uh, probably the Chinese, the Han Chinese know better than the minority. At that time, the minority people did not understand what was really going on. Because there was uh, also the propaganda was hitting them. Also, they thought that you know it was okay. It's the case of Tashi Wangchu. Typically, he thought that he could go to Beijing, meet foreign correspondents, and tell them that he couldn't you know have uh, education in Tibetan. That this wasn't a crime. So where's the problem? But in my case, I wouldn't have done that that video. I wouldn't have done it. Um, but he insisted, I think he insisted. So, yes, this is very difficult. And, um, but today, you see, for instance, today you have this Xinjiang problem, which is uh, uh, widespread. So, until now, all the Uyghur people who are, in, in, who are not in China, who are abroad, they didn't dare <coughs> to talk. Because they were afraid of what could happen to their family there. But seeing what is happening now, it's so widespread that it doesn't have any sense now to not to talk. So more and more and more people are talking because you know, the degree of repression is so high that you don't have any incentive to shut up. So maybe this is, I mean, the determinant, the determinant, what is more important is the degree of repression uh, on the field. It's not what we do. It's what is happening on the field. This, is, this determines the way that we can report or not. Yeah, I think I have more or less the same to say. So when I, I went to Tibet and I spoke to these two tour guides, of course, I, beforehand I said it's anonymous. Uh, we, filmed them in the dark, and in one case it was, the injury was done in a sort of tea house, and my cameraman filmed the guy who was behind the glass, tea glass, so he was not, but afterwards he, he contacted me and said, can you please black out the background as well, because this is a tea house that belongs to my friends, some of my friends, and I don't want, they will recognize it. So we did it as well. Um, it's true that it's different in, in, in 
in China with Han Chinese. I remember in, when I was last in, in China in October, I interviewed a, a writer, a dissident writer living in Beijing, and he insisted on having his name and his face. I had a photograph of him because I did an online report at that time because he said, I want to show people that there are still some courageous people in China that speak out. I know I, this is a risk, but this is what I want and what I have to do. So in that case, I, I took the same decision. And we, um, I, I still had contact with him a couple of months after that, and he was still okay. I, I don't know now, but uh, it, it's, as I said, it's a thin line being a journalist and covering China, and it's getting harder. It's getting harder, really. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have time for one more, um, and then we need, uh, out of respect to the next panel, uh, move on. But one more, please. Uh, just one question uh, about the under-reporting of the self-reparation. Of course, uh, you know, the Chinese government tries to pre prevent any information coming out and uh, making it difficult. But on, this, on the other side, is there not also some kind of uh, negligence on the part of the media because, you know, uh, because the Chinese government doesn't allow any access to Tibet, therefore we cannot report about it. It's a little bit easy, I think. Yeah. For, for, uh, um, especially in the case of the self -interest. if you cannot report up the environment of those people who, uh, who self-immolated and talk to their friends and families. But there are people in India who self-immolated. Mm. The access is open. You can talk to parents, friends, fellow Tibetans who have lived with them and draw parallels to the self-immolated inside Tibet and saying, you know, we can't go to Tibet and meet those people and talk to those these people, but you, you can only go to India. So therefore, on the one hand, doesn't the media make it too easy you know, for the under-reporting of the, of the self-information? I'm pointing this out because I think this uh, is very, very tragic because Obviously, if this 154 Tibetans, of whom we know by name, if these were suicide bombers, everyone would talk about it. Every newspaper would, you know, be happy to make, you know, to report about it. But because the Tibetan self in self immunities despite all the desperation, still they, did want, they didn't want to harm and hurt and kill anybody else, mm. except hurting themselves. So for many Tibetans, it's some, in a sense, a kind of non-violence <coughs> law, not harming other people, not killing people. So again, uh, example that non-violence is not being paid enough attention by the media and by the uh, society. Oh. Well, I can say that is not <coughs> true. That is not true. Every correspondent I knew when I was in Beijing wanted to go there. I know many of them who tried to go there, who tried many times to go there and to find a family, etc., etc and who every time were stopped by the, by the, you know, the, the checkpoints and turned back to Beijing many times. So it's not that they didn't want, it's really because it was really difficult. If I did it, it's because maybe I was more cunning than, than most of all, most of them, and that I used really some means that I just cannot say. So, um, it, it is obviously, uh, it is obviously difficult. That's why we don't have this coverage. It was the same thing for the, the incidents in Xinjiang, exactly the same. It was very violent, very bloody, 
But the same thing, we couldn't go and cover and understand what happened and what was the reasons, etc. So be, be it uh, pacifist or violent, it's the same thing. We, are, we were not, we are not uh, allowed to cover those things. One, one, one thing is because chi the Chinese government doesn't want the Chinese people to know very exactly what's happening because probably people would be a bit afraid, some panic, something, so they don't want that. In the case of the Tibetans, maybe people would have some sympathy. We don't want that neither. So uh, they don't want the Chinese Han majority to know what's going on in the... But it's true also for land grab protests. It's the same thing. You cannot go there and, and, and cover it uh, normally. You have to go to find ways to go to, to the place because there are checkpoints everywhere. But there are more in minority areas, that's true. For what happened in India, I cannot say because you know we are correspondents in China, we're not in India. So maybe you should speak to correspondents in India. But the fact is that there is a huge sympathy for Tibetan self-immolators. What lacks is the possibility to go to access. That's, that's the, the only thing which is lacking. Um, I think we did, especially the years when there were many, mm -hmm. we, we did report it at my station. I remember typing the, even on radio or, or online, uh, especially when it was like the 100 person or but it's hard to write more than just the numbers if you can't talk to family, if you don't have the personal story around it, then it, it stays with, this is happening in Tibet, and, and it's, we hear it's, it's, this, it's a young person, or it's a monk, or it's a, but then that's it. So in this case, the, the measures of the Chinese government preventing people from talking to the families are, are indeed effective. That's true. Okay, uh, this is such an important point and we could go on forever, but uh, out of respect to our next panel, um, I want to thank all of you for your time. Um, we're going to uh, now move to the second panel of today's conference. The, uh, the topic of the second panel is institutional initiatives to promote reciprocity and access. So now we're going to get into um, some of the nuts and bolts of this. Um, as we discussed in the last panel, issues uh, are complex um, and varied, and the application of solutions, um, uh, there's definitely lessons to learn, I think, from, uh, from other examples in the United States, but there are unique challenges here in the European Union. For me, many questions remain after that last panel, and, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we can get to some of, the, some of them. First and foremost, is the climate right for a possible EU solution to the access question? Can the concept of EU-China reciprocity extend beyond trade as it's currently invoked? Can the situation that we saw in the United States serve as an example? Uh, and could elements of that be replicated here in Europe? Or is that better suited for the political environment across the pond? These are just a few of my questions, but to help us digest it all, we have a great panel. Uh, for this second round. Bas Belder, sitting to my left, is a member of the European Parliament from the Netherlands. He's also a former journalist, which I <coughs> just learned. He made a good choice. Um, <laughs> and he's also the, uh, the rapporteur of the recently adopted European Parliament report on the state of EU-China relations. Henri Melos is a member of, uh, and former president of the European Economic and Social Committee and a long-time defender of human rights and the rights of religious minorities in China, including Tibetans. Guillaume Arnel, sitting to his left, French senator and member of the French Senate's International Information Group on Tibet. Uh, and all the way at the end, Jonathan Hatwell, head of the division for China, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the European External Action Service. Joining us on the screen behind us will be James McGovern, a Democratic congressman from the United States, the state of Massachusetts, with a pre-recorded message, Congressman McGovern was one of the two co-sponsors of the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act that we discussed previously, which passed in the U.S. House of Representatives on September 25th. 
So let's begin with uh, Mr. Belder, who has to leave after his remarks and a few questions. So uh, we will uh, take an opportunity to ask him a couple questions before he runs out the door, if that's okay. But the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you. Although I was regretted, I came uh, late because of my uh, appointments. For the, as a foreign journalist, I uh, enjoyed uh, the interventions uh, of both journalists in the former panel. And uh, I must say, uh, I have been four times, I had uh, the privilege to be four times a uh, rapporteur for the European Parliament on EU child relations. And, uh, I benefited a lot of uh, the contacts and also uh, the meetings uh, between uh, foreign more eyes uh, with the foreign uh, China uh, correspondent club, who uh, every year uh, gives a very interesting uh, report on uh, what is going on. And um, uh, I must say, when I was invited, I was uh, thinking by myself. Uh, Especially, I'm following the, the German press as a Dutchman because of the excellent correspondence on China. Uh, and I uh, think then on uh, Frankfurt Allgemeine, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Neue Zürich Zeitung. And uh, what, I, uh, what was interesting that they saw the. the uh, and when I'm missing something, I uh, you tell me <coughs> that especially. Um, uh, journalist, uh, Western journalist, uh, visited, uh, managed to visit Xinjiang. And that is at, the, at the moment, uh, that is uh, the flashing point. Eh? Uh, and uh, less Tibet, although you can compare it, of course. Eh? So uh, I hope that one of the ladies, one of the journalists, or others, uh, uh, managed in a short time also to visit Tibet to give a glimpse for when there is no reciprocity. I must say that. What I learned about the uh, latest report of uh, uh, Western European journalists about Xinjiang, it was revealing. Even if they could not, of course, mention the names and so on the locations, it was revealing. So, uh, I grew up in the Cold War. I studied at the University of Utrecht uh, East European History and the University of Leiden Chinese History. And it looks like, uh, uh, born in 1946, if the world uh, uh, should stay. But we have seen the dissolution of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, it is the nightmare of the Chinese dream, of course. And uh, what happened in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, how we enlarged as European uh, Europe. So we should uh, uh, even uh, very totalitarian regimes, as we have at the moment in China, eh, there are also cracks. Eh? Human life is stronger, and it's also important that it gives, uh, that it gives optimism. And uh, but that said, of course, uh, when you uh, when you look at, uh, eh, I must also say, uh, reciprocity is on all the levels. I think it's rational how you treat. A partner, and even China is a strategic partner. Strategic partner. How you should treat another partner? You should also be receive the same treatment. Quite logical, quite rational. I have said it quite openly. They were not. They, I have no idea how they are looking at me after four reports on EU-China, but that, not, that doesn't bother me. And you should be honest and uh, and uh, not look in the confrontation. I said quite clearly to the. The Central Committee of the CCP some months ago. Eh, you uh, you might have your dreams, Chinese dreams, but uh, forgive me, I don't share this dream. And there are a lot of people in China, especially in Xinjiang, Tibet, that also don't share this dream. Eh, and you should cope with it and be open. And uh, uh, I think, and uh, but that's it. Uh, I'm very uh, grateful to my colleagues of the European Parliament in the Foreign Affairs Committee and also in the plenary that say uh, with a great majority uh, supported this position towards also uh, reciprocity and access to Tibet. Quite uh, good. It was also for me when I compared in the years uh, since 2005 to now 2018, four times uh, after EU China. Uh, that uh, especially the last time the uh, EU delegation is Beijing is, and I want to underline, does a tremendous job. 
they were, were great help for me, and they have a very difficult position, of course, eh? It's very openly, I learned a lot there on the spot, and I hope to return because that is important for us. One of the, the <coughs> one of the really uh, things in the relation between the EU and China is that the Chinese always are playing down to divide us. They even said some years ago in a report, and I learned uh, personally also, they said to me even we don't uh, we don't uh, have to uh, to. Uh, to do our utmost to divide you because you are already divided. And what is now needed, especially is on the European side, that the, the three main institutions, the Council, the Commission, and also the Parliament, are uh, standing united, especially in these uh, human rights issues. Eh? For look, eh, uh, since 2012, we have 60 plus 1. And the Chinese are even thinking about an alternative to the relationship between the EU and China with uh, a northern uh, uh, division and a southern division. Okay. Uh, I'm closely following the look what is happening, for example, in Italy towards China. Yeah? Uh, because of uh, the financial issues, and they are looking towards uh, so-called uh, soft Chinese loans, but we, we, we know what are the, the soft Chinese loans. Eh? There are inclusions from the Chinese side, and that has an impact, of course, on our position. Do we really speak our mind on main issues, that is, uh, on fundamental rights, and that also, of course, that is the, the core of this, the this Tibet. And uh, uh, preparing to come to you, I like to, I'm an historian, so I like to read. Uh, I don't trust myself to, to speak on what I'm thinking, but I try to read and to have an idea. Uh, but I was struck by an uh, interesting article in the Diplomat from uh, September uh, 22nd uh, of this year from uh, Tenzin Tsurim, uh, and uh, the, the title was uh, striking a boiling pot. But the CCP's increasing intrusive, intrusive surveillance in Tibet. And uh, he referred at the end of this interesting article to an expert on uh, the, uh, the demographic map of China and the, all the nations in China, that is uh, the leading scholar on ethnic uh, politics, politics, James Leibold. He wrote already in 2012 an article, also in the diplomat, can China have a melting pot? And uh, Dr. Tenzin Tsurim wrote at the end of the article, it, see, it now seems clear that if the CCP continues its current ongoing repressive policies in Tibet and Xinjiang, it will have boiling pots rather than melting pots in its backyard. And we should, uh, it looks, it seems, that China is stable, stability, but uh, the more you are expanding on the surveillance state, the more it is quite clear that you are very insecure. And when you treat uh, human beings in such a way as in Xinjiang and in Tibet, uh, <coughs> then not uh, morally you are bankrupt, but also it can be that uh, an implosion is uh, the consequence. Eh? Uh, the EU is not uh, striving for uh, the implosion of uh, the empire of President Xi Jinping, but what we want is, when we speak uh, as a strategic partners, we should be very clear to them that reciprocity, it is uh, more than opportune that we get uh, some proofs instead of words of reciprocity. And in the meantime, that we don't get it, eh, uh, we have a brave, a courageous, and in, in, in very important, but, uh, the example of uh, the two uh, journalists in our midst, and that is important, with brains, with knowledge. For when you have no knowledge, you are, uh, uh, you are playing uh, uh, in, the hand to, in the hand of the Chinese. Eh? For when people, when a regime is hiding reality, we should have knowledge, and therefore, uh, for the coming times, uh, and that is also uh, my idea in the report, that uh, given the situation, the EU should invest financially eh, in uh, deep knowledge of what is going on in China, and also in supporting, quite openly in support, investigative journalism in 
the people's department of Yang, especially in a time when journalists have a difficult job because uh, more and more I get information uh, that uh, uh, Chinese embassies uh, well, they are not satisfied with the <coughs> articles, the comment, uh, commentaries and works of foreign correspondents that say uh, uh, ring or write or contact uh, the bosses of these journalists or to say that uh, there should be a move. But uh, again, as a former journalist, so I'm very subjective, of course, eh? I'm very subjective, but they are for me the eyes and the ears. Eh? I'm, uh, I'm dealing with, as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee with the Middle East, even as the Far East. In the Middle East, I have my own ears and eyes, which is an excellent uh, scholar there who was uh, writing and I'm following every day with him. Uh, perhaps that is my Chinese dream to have the same person but also person of course on Chinese uh, territory. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you for, for those remarks. Um, I, I will ask a, a quick question and then open it up to uh, questions from the audience before uh, Mr. Bowler has to leave. The, the State of EU-China Relations Report that was adopted in September lists uh, a long list of uh, recommendations with some very strong language, um, calling on Chinese authorities to allow Tibetans to travel freely to Tibet, European Tibetans as well. Um, uh, access for United Nations High Commission for Human Rights, uh, the list kind of goes on. I wonder if you could just give us a sense, um, how much appetite is there for pursuing and adopting these policies in European capitals? You touched on it a little bit, but the division piece, the, the divide and, and conquer type of strategy that is employed, yeah. how effective is that? And can it be, um, on this issue at least, um, uh, dealt with? Excellent question. It is, uh, I hope, not a too simple answer, but that is uh, devoted uh, politicians like my colleague here, uh, Mr. Thomas, uh, MEP uh, Thomas Mann, who is already for years and now he's uh, sticking to the issue. You should have continuity. It is not for me writing a report and it is over now. I, ha I had the idea after four uh, EU China report, I should improve myself. Uh, you are eager to see what is happening. But so go on and try, especially uh, MEPs, and because of this uh, Chinese tactic of dividing us, uh, that on the national level there should be uh, scrutiny. And I'm also very glad that there's an institute in MacArthur Institute uh, uh, in, in Berlin that is excellent, is very, and, and, and wrote, uh, that was in February of this year, an excellent report that said we are focusing on the Russian influence in Europe, we should also focus more and more on the Chinese influence for Confucius Institute or uh, good relations with the university because of the Chinese departments. Uh, uh, and, and I know as a journalist, when I was a journalist, I spoke with uh, experts and who said, no, uh, I was asking them, how do you view the situation? And they said quite openly, uh, also question, because I want to do field work there. And then they are not happy with me. And I learned, for example, it, is, it, it, it occurs even on the highest level. I don't mention the name, but I know from an excellent German scholar, uh, with a, 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 a sinologist, okay, who was invited by the German embassy to give a speech and said, say, the time and delay the visa, so it was too late. Such tactics. And I'm not saying we should take events, but we should uh, take them on the fingers and uh, say uh, that's not, uh, that is not, uh, that doesn't belong to the strategic partnership. And also to say, you uh, say are clever people. You know what you are doing. What are the consequences? You are not improving your image. Totally not. Okay? Are you sleeping well? <laughs> are there questions from the audience, Ursula? Yes, I have some one question about the Confucius Institutes that you just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, we know that in the United States, uh, the Congress is uh, getting involved in this, and yeah. and uh, you know many of those Confucius Institutes are shutting down. But we see the Confucius Institutes develop in Europe. What could the EU do in this perspective? 
quite practical issue. I'm in contact with uh, scholars on this issue, and they will, uh, for me, uh, have a close look on it, what is going on there. And from several countries, I'm, uh, there's an issue that I was, because what happened in the United States, I was very uh, curious what was happening on the European soil. At, but uh, there will be, um, th in the next month, there will be a uh, new report on, uh, there is a network now of uh, European cooperation between academic institutes, uh, and that is uh, especially what is happening in the relation between, uh, on the member states level, between the capitals and Beijing. And, and, and what, uh, what are the uh, differences and what are the divisions that, who are, who are, uh, that are, which are weakening us? So, uh, many uh, will we stay in contact, I feel, uh, what I uh, learn, and uh, I, I, I ask it, uh, I ask it as, as a scholar. And when we have here, you are limited, eh? you have other things to do, and you have, uh, I'm an historian, simple historian, so you should use academic knowledge. I spoke last week uh, with an, an excellent uh, Chinese in exile scholar, and we will write for me a report on uh, EU China with new uh, uh, linking domestic politics with foreign politics. And so what I want to say is, when you are really involved as an MEP, you should invest uh, that is with money uh, for your knowledge, uh, not to cope for your knowledge, to cope with this issue, and then you are uh, it is not, of course, not, uh, you know, uh, journalist, uh, and we, I'm a little bit uh, afraid of, about PR. It is not PR, it is on contents, and politicians should concentrate on contents. But uh, we will exchange cards and uh, we will see. Uh, one question, how, how, how simplistic approach you, you can have. I vividly remembered that I'm a Protestant, so what I want to see is, uh, Protestant service eh? or Catholic service, uh, but the Christian service there. And, and when we were then, we say he made a program for us, it was in 2005, as my assistant, it was in the autumn. And uh, I asked for, uh, we were then in Xi'an, uh, uh, because of the, uh, uh, tourism and so on. Eh? And uh, uh, I asked for uh, to be on, on, on Sunday on, in a Christian church, and I got the answer. There is no church in Xi'an. <laughs> so what my sister did, he he looked for and had a long list, and we transferred it to the to the delegation. But such things, eh, I, I can't imagine that you. Uh, what are you thinking about uh, Europeans? Eh, as is uh, all certain <coughs> people, that is, uh, and you should you should say it. Eh? I teach you in the honest way. Come on, do the same as me. We are human beings. All right, unfortunately, I'm going to take back what I said. Um, I, I was just told that at 6 o'clock the lights go out. Um, so uh, let's thank um, Sabella for his time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and if you have any questions for me, you can take them out there. No, I, uh, I learned here more than I uh, gave. <laughs> All the best for you. We, uh, okay, so now let's move to uh, Henri Malos, um, who has uh, <coughs> done quite a lot of work on the issue um, of, of Tibet and has uh, visited Dharamsala <coughs> in time, um, and recently gave a speech in which you um, talked about the need to engage more deeply with the, uh, the Tibetan diaspora, uh, the Dalai Lama, and the Central Tibetan Administration. So perhaps you could uh, just Give us an overview of the situation as you see it, and what do you think um, European yeah. member states could be doing? <coughs> yes, thank you very much. First of all, I'm uh, so very pleased to be here today, and I think we celebrate with today, or was yesterday, the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I think this uh, this meeting is very is very appropriate. So President Tajani made the declaration on that. Uh, I will start uh, my, my short intervention <laughs> with, uh, um, by telling you an anecdote uh, about reciprocity. Vincent asked me to tell you an anecdote. Uh, I will come back to my personal experience very briefly. But when I was preparing my second visit <coughs> to Dharamsala, third, third, uh, second official, with uh, the help of Ovenson and NICT, and I was president of the European body, European institution. And of course, the Chinese uh, mission tried to prevent me to go. 
And I remember that uh, I got a visit from the Chinese ambassador, I think the lady is still there. And uh, I'm from Corsica, of course. And she told me, uh, but Mr. President, what would you say if I asked you to go to Corsica and to meet in Corsica the separatist movement as you will meet the Dalai Lama, not in Tibet, but in Dharamsa? And my answer was reciprocity, was the yeah, ambassador. These are my friends. In Corsica, you have, uh, you have Independence Party, Autonomous Party, and others. We are registered. They are, I know them very well. So come and uh, you will meet them. So she didn't find that funny. <laughs> and uh, I think this was the end of, uh, of the reciprocity process. Uh, to be, <coughs> to be even frank on your, your question, I would say that uh, my, my first experience was in 2011. It was also a case, case of reciprocity because our prayer at that time was not president. The president went to China. The Chinese bring him and his delegation to Tibet, to Lhasa, to the guided tour. Uh, and then uh, our president said that after I want to, to go to Dharamsala because I want to see the, the other face of the question. And the Chinese uh, tell him, if you do that, you won't come again to China. So he didn't went to Lhasa, to Dharamsala, uh, but he sent me, I was at that time kind of vice president, and we went, thanks to Vincent, and I saw what, uh, what really reminds me, the cold war time, but escaping from the mountains, young people, and, and things that you know. Uh, and then in 2014, uh, as president, I visited Dharamsala for the 10th of March, and I can say, because there is an ES colleague here, I got a lot of trouble including for, for you personally, but for, I got a nice letter, not nice letter, from, uh, from Lady Ashton telling me, Mr. President, should remind you that you are not allowed to modify the position of the European Union, which is that there is just one China, blah, blah, blah. I didn't say that was not one China, but I met, I met, I met his holiness, and I participated also with uh, Thomas Manuel together, I remember, to do, when the President Xi Jinping was there, I got a lot of troubles, even inside of uh, our institutions. Some colleagues, very pro China, some staff tried to ask me to resign. And so, on. so, in a way, I, for the time, I'm not allowed to go to China. But what I would like to say is that I, I don't understand, and this is a real question for, for years, I don't, I don't understand this, but uh, I think, uh, I think it was. Uh, Mr. Gauthier, you, you quoted that as a kind of, uh, you say the attitude of the European Union is timidity. Timidity. Uh, I, I would say uh, it's more than timidity. I'm, I'm not a diplomat, so I can say it's a, it's a kind of complaisance. Complaisance is close to complicity, I'm sorry to say that. Uh, I just take, uh, today we have, uh, just going from something else about Tibet, but, uh, uh, I've been told that there is this Shenyang uh, show, which is a uh, okay, Chinese dissident close to Falun Gong. The Chinese are interfering on the presentation of this show. For example, in Brussels, I know that Itia de la Monnaie has been pressured by the Chinese, Chinese uh, mission, Chinese embassy, to say, don't, don't accept them. If you, if you accept them, you won't have any Chinese tourists and uh, nothing. And, and they didn't accept them. We know that some member states, where the Chinese are invested a lot, I will have <laughs> not afraid to mention the name, it can be Greece and Romania, where the Chinese have a huge investment, and maybe some others. Uh, when we see the in council minutes, when it's about China and human rights, they always are on the side of China. Or don't say, don't say, don't say anything. So why this, I will say, this complaint not attitude. I will just give one, one other example, and then I will talk very short to some some of my recommendations on this issue. Why this double standard between China and Russia? I cannot be accused to be a pro-China, a pro-Russia person, because also Mr. Putin put me on his blacklist among, among the 89 persons because I was in, in Kiev, in, in Mina. But cannot compare. And when you see how the European Union can be very tough on what happened in Russia, sometimes with, uh, okay, with good reasons, but and so silent with China. Each meeting with the Russian is about human rights and scandalous blah, blah. But China, total silent. Why? So coming to my uh, point, I will say that um, I will make three recommendations to go in this uh, 
uh, excellent idea of, uh, of, uh, of reciprocity. First point is to stop to be so, uh, to so sharp, uh, timid. Stop, we should stop that. We should, but we say, in French, we say, appeler un chat, un chat. I don't know if you say that in English, call a cat a cat. Tell the truth, <laughs> tell what is the reality. Right? China is a communist dictatorship. Where tortures, some organ arresting, uh, say, discrimination, uh, are, <coughs> are made at a, at a large scale. You know, now when we know what, what's happening in, in, in Chinga with, uh, with the Uyghur community, it's more than a million people who are put in retention camp. So we should stop to lie and stop to be shy. I would say stop to be complacent and to be, and to be complex. Uh, the second point is to use all opportunities that uh, we have to put this question of human rights, of Tibetan, but, but in the same time of others, question, dissident, uh, even Taiwan, all the questions on the table, which occasion we need to find it. Uh, when I met the Dalai Lama in 2014, uh, he told me, because we had a long conversation and a personal one, he told me, please give a message to uh, President Xi Jinping, that he was visiting Brussels some, some weeks later, but, but I'm ready to uh, to uh, to talk to him, and and I would say that uh, I'm very thankful to the only person who accept to pass this message was President Van Rompuy, which really I admire a lot because he had the courage to put the question on the table, but not the others, unfortunately. So we should put. We have today. We have this year the European. It's mentioned in the document European Year of China, European Tourism, or something like that. We should put the question of access to Tibet. We should put directly in case of reciprocity. And I put the question, I send a letter to the, to the commissioner who is in charge of that. Uh, this answer was, uh, as you say, uh, <laughs> timid. <laughs> timid to say, of course, we can just stop it, blah, blah, blah. But, but nothing concrete we should do. And my third recommendation is that uh, the French, I think, we, we are all not naive. We know that as long as this regime which continues on this uh, dictatorship trend, and it's getting worse, unfortunately, we won't expect anything, but we have to gather together all the uh, victims of these regimes, Tibetan, Uyghurs, Kazakh, Mongols, and other minorities, Chinese themselves, uh, Chinese abroad, diaspora, and to put pressure that this regime ends and that they should understand that, that they cannot continue, either want to be a global partner uh, in, in all international issues, they want to be considered as a, as a stable uh, partner, they should change their, their regime. If they don't change, they should say, as I say, call a cat a cat and stop, stop this, uh, this complicity. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, um, uh, as, you're, as you're speaking. Um, and, and now I think we're going to have, uh, there's a video from James McGovern, so we'll take a, a, a bit of a break from the live panelists. Um, but just a, a quick comment, that point that we, looking at how the regime acts and, and responds, dealing with all of the issues, whether it's Tibet and, and now Xinjiang, um, it's, it's, it's becoming harder and harder to separate issues um, and lumping them and including them together seems that it, it's a strategy that you're referring to, um, uh, and that others are as well. But my editorialization. Good afternoon. I'm Jim McGovern, a member of the United States House of Representatives and the co-chair of the Congressional Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. I want to thank the International Campaign for Tibet, the International Federation for Human Rights, and distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Human Rights of the European Parliament for organizing this timely conference on access to Tibet and the principle of reciprocity, a topic I am passionate about. I regret that I am unable to participate in person, but very much appreciate the invitation to join you by video. Last September 12th, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the Bipartisan Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, a bill that I authored. Under the bill, Chinese authorities involved in the design and implementation of policies that restrict travel to Tibetan areas become ineligible to receive a visa or be admitted to the United States. 
Now, why this bill? The basis of diplomatic law is mutual access and reciprocity. But although Chinese diplomats, journalists, and tourists travel freely within the United States, the government of the People's Republic of China has erected many barriers to travel in areas of China inhabited by ethnic Tibetans. American diplomats, journalists, and tourists must obtain permission to enter the Tib Tibet Autonomous Region, the TAR, a requirement that does not exist for any other provincial level entity of China. Visitors also face obstacles to their ability to travel to Tibetan areas outside the TAR. Restricted access to Tibet has many negative consequences uh, for Tibetans in China and for American citizens. Tibetans are left isolated from the rest of the world. Meanwhile, their well-documented suffering under Chinese rule, arbitrary detention, torture, and ill treatment, and extensive government surveillance, restrictions on the use of their language and their religious and cultural practices is hidden from sight. Preventing diplomats, journalists, and tourists from traveling to Tibet makes it much harder to assess the full scope of these abuses. On the other side, China's travel restrictions deny our citizens the right to visit one of the most beautiful places on earth and to experience Tibetan culture and all its richness. And in emergencies, Americans may be denied help due to China's restrictive policies. In fact, after an October 2013 bus crash in the TAR, which left three Americans dead and many others injured, U.S. consular officers were severely hindered in their ability to respond because they faced a long delay in obtaining permission to travel to the region. And following a 2015 earthquake that trapped dozens of U.S. citizens in the TAR, the U.S. Consulate General faced significant challenges in providing emergency consular assistance. Now, I know firsthand how important access to Tibet is because I had the opportunity to join Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi and several other members of Congress for a visit there in November of 2015. I saw the tight control the government exercises over virtually all aspects of the daily lives of Tibetans. And I had people thank me for being there, re remembering them and fighting for their rights. This is an unacceptable state of affairs. That is why the House passed the uh, Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act. And that is why I fully expect the United States Senate to follow our lead. The message we are sending is that if the Chinese government wants its citizens and officials to continue to travel freely in the U.S., then Americans, including Tibetan Americans, must be able to travel freely in China, including Tibet. Now, I'm very happy to see this same message coming from Europe. I welcome the recent report on EU-China relations with its language on the importance of access and reciprocity, and I want to thank uh, Member of Parliament Belder for his leadership on this, uh, on this issue. So I want to thank you again for permitting me to offer these brief remarks. Uh, I look forward to hearing the conclusions and the recommendations from the conference and to future. Um, so building on that, the, 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 the last point that, that the congressman made was, it was it's nice to see these conversations happening here in Europe. One of the things that, uh, that Mr. Belder's report in the EU-China uh, state, of, uh, state of Affairs report looked at and, and suggested was larger member states take the lead in defining and acting on some of these requests. So now I move um, uh, to Ms. Arnel uh, in that capacity, representing uh, the Senate from France. And I will ask you just really quickly before uh, you start your remarks, if you could, after you do, um, build into the response, how does, how does France define reciprocity and is access uh, a piece of that definition? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll get to your question. <laughs> I, but um, I first want to Mr. Brooklyn and uh, Mr. Chairman Thomas Mann and uh, Christian Bacrida, honorable members of Parliament, uh, colleagues and friends of uh, Tibet. Uh, I'm proud to be here with you this evening, among you, and to represent my country, France along with my colleague from the National Assembly, Madame Elisabeth Fortu-Picard, here present also, as chair lady of the set committee um, in the National Assembly, uh, the Friendship Committee uh, France-Tibet. Second to that, as uh, the Senate, and I'll get to my declaration, and also my territory, St. Martin. 
So I therefore bring to you, I therefore bring to you one greetings from my fellow citizens. Allow me to rapidly situate my island, St. Martin, a small Caribbean island situated just a few miles away from a well-known U.S. territory, Puerto Rico, and divided into two sovereignties, St. Martin, south, the Dutch part, and St. Martin, north, the French side. Like few other French overseas territory, St. Martin has a special statute. In 2007, we became an autonomous overseas collectivity ruled by a territorial council and decided to become a full OCT with one representative in the National Assembly serving St. Martin and the neighbor island of St. Bart's and one in the Senate. And since 2014, I've held the position of Senator. Personally, I have had an interest, a long interest, in the issues that affect Tibet. Many years ago, when I was a student in Lyon, in the southeast of France, I met a Tibetan refugee who became a very close friend, Jamyang Samfel. He, hold, he told me his story, how his family needed to flee their homeland to escape persecution from the Chinese authority. And ever since meeting him, the Tibetan cause has become something I hold close to my heart. After the midterm election last year in the Senate, I was promoted to vice chair of the parliamentary group France Tibet. The chair, Mr. Michel Rizon, couldn't be here this afternoon. And uh, he therefore asked me to represent him and also our committee, I value the privilege. Our parliamentary group organized meetings on a regular basis. Recently, some of our members met with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, with representative of the Tibetan government <coughs> and the Tibetan parliament who are in exile, either in Paris or in Dalai Salah. We have also interviewed people from NGOs, journalists, historians, and other experts who have interest in the Tibetan crisis. We regularly participate in conferences and congress and debates as well. However, our views of the current situation in Tibet remains that of an outsider. We can only rely on testimonies, exile statements, and NGO statements. As MPs, we are accustomed to travel freely and work and investigate with very few restrictions. This limited view of what life is truly like in Tibet <coughs> is highly frustrating, as it is currently almost impossible to visit Tibet. We are forced to rely on information, official information, from the Chinese authority that is impossible to verify. We have no <coughs> feedbacks from international observers due to the limited access to the area. We can only imagine the horror, the arbitrary arrest and detentions the destructions of temples, the immolations. So, as MPs and as a parliamentarian group, what can we do? First of all, Michel Rezon, our chair, writes very regularly to the ministers to remind them the recurrent and sensitive issues some have already mentioned the human rights violation of the Tibetan people, the destruction of Tibetan temples, most recently at La Runga, the countless violation of freedom of speech and freedom of expression, cultural and religious practices. The case of Manchu comes to my mind at this moment. 
And I'm sure that you all know the story of this young Tibetan who tried to fight against the suppression of Tibetan language enforced by the Chinese government. How many anonymous people have been <coughs> oppressed like Tashi and who are now in jail or even worse? Laurunga, Tashi Bancho. We need to say these names more loudly and more clearly to remind ourselves that today in Tibet, people are still fighting for their freedom. The resilient, non-violent way Tibetans are fighting for their rights and freedom is an example for us all. But it's not enough. What I'm saying now was written in an official letter to Emmanuel Macron, our president, who is sensitive to the cause. But we know that sometimes, as Henri Malos mentioned, we are timid in our approach. And we want to seize this opportunity of the openness and the frankness of this new elected president, and even to use the influence of their first lady, as it happens with Madame Chirac for the hospitals, and it happened with uh, Daniel Mitterrand, to use Brigitte Macron as an essential tool to get the message to her husband so that he may be able to transmit it with force and conviction wherever he can and whenever he has the opportunity to do so. We reminded him of what we believe France should stand for. The respect of fundamental rights of the Tibetan people, the protection of the Tibetan culture and identity, and of course, not much I've mentioned it, but the ecological protection of the Tibetan plateau. More recently, last April, we requested a meeting with the Chinese ambassador in Paris. As the last visit of our parliamentarian group to Tibet was in 2006. We would like to organize in this European Union and Chinese tourism year a visit to the Tibetan area of the Chinese Republic. As I mentioned previously, we need to see ourselves the current situation of Tibet and also to notice what has changed since our last visit 12 years ago. To this day, we have never had any response from the Chinese embassy, despite several calls or letters and reminders. If tomorrow Chinese MP or official applied for a visa to come to France, I'm very sure that the French embassy would respond to their request without hesitation. I believe this example illustrates perfectly today's topic Chinese authority do not, does not reflect, fully respect the principles of reciprocity. In international relations and treaties, the principles of reciprocity states that favors, benefits, or penalties that are granted by one state to the citizens or legal entities of another should be returned in common. What we have experienced so far reinforced the ICT report, Access Denied Chinese Enforced Isolation of Tibet, and the case for reciprocity published on May 9, 2018. Mr. Vincent Metten, who opened the conference with a welcome address, came to the French Senate last June to present to us the conclusion of his remarkable report. I want to thank take this opportunity to thank him again for his exchange and also the ICT team for all the work that they are doing. International relationships are difficult to comprehend for most people. And I think our first role is to analyze, to understand, and to debate them. If we are convinced Chinese enforce the isolation on Tibet, Contrary to what Chinese authorities claim, the first thing we need to do is to share it with the public 
and share it loudly. Too often, and you are right, Mr. Mallows, we are so timid with China, when we are so forceful with Putin and with others, we should do the same and have the same attitude towards China. That's why I think a meeting like today really matters. I want to thank Christian Dan Prada as well, Thomas Mann, the IC team and the International Federation for Human Rights for the organization of this event and all the people who made it possible. For the Tibetan people that are listening to us today, I want to let them know that they are constantly in our thoughts, in our minds, and in our hearts. The members of parliament of the parliamentary group France Tibet are at your side, and we will keep fighting at your side to continue to amplify the Tibetan voice. Thank you very much for those remarks. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask a question at the at the beginning uh, of, yeah. of uh, uh, actually Mr. Hartwell. I'm sorry, I'm moving uh, down. Yeah. We have uh, seven minutes, um, uh, so I'll ask my question at the beginning, uh, as I did um, uh, with your colleague. Uh, in your remarks, uh, Mr. Hartwell, if, if uh, uh, you might touch on the EU's position uh, on reciprocity. Um, uh, and specifically, can it be extended, the access question, to the EU-China visa facilitation roadmap that's currently being discussed? Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. And um, I intend to focus on the question of, of reciprocity to the theme, uh, today. Um, I also want to respond to uh, some of the um, very uh, direct recommendations that have been made. Um, I'm However, going to duck the question, if I may, specifically on the visa facilitation agreement, and uh, my um, my explanation for doing that is uh, I'm three months into this job. I'm still um, very much getting to grips with it, and um, uh, focusing so far on the on sort of the big picture, and, and not yet fully conversing with every um, negotiation strand of the relationship. But I hope I can nevertheless. Um, uh, respond to, um, to the, uh, the broad questions that have been raised. Um, so I'm going to say a few words in a moment about um, EU-China relations generally, what we're doing on uh, human rights, and uh, within that specifically in relation to Tibet. But before I do that, I want to respond to some of the um, earlier comments and interventions on um, specifically calling for reciprocity to be applied in a, in a very and direct and specific way in the, in the, in the relation to access. Um, I just want to um, be very, um, very open um, here and say that, um, first of all, reciprocity is um, a, uh, a centerpiece and a kind of uh, general um, underpinning of our approach uh, to China. Um, it's something that has um, risen up the agenda and become much more prominent since uh, 2016 with the adoption of the EU-China um, strategy. It's something that, as you heard from um, uh, Mr. Belda, is also um, uh, reflected in the uh, European Parliament um, resolution. Uh, of course, that's a uh, resolution of the European Parliament. The Parliament has its institutional role, just as the um, HRDP has her role and the ES in support of her and Council has its role. Nevertheless, um, in her comments to the uh, European Parliament plenary when the report was debated, uh, HRDP Bomberini expressed um, strong support um, and appreciation for, for the um, position taken by the Parliament in that, in that resolution. Um, however, when it comes to um, how you apply um, reciprocity and how you understand reciprocity, I just want to be um, very clear and say that, um, as also um, Professor Novak mentioned, there are different ways of looking at this question, and I think he um, expressed his view that um, there's a very kind of uh, narrow and um, um, rigid link on uh, reciprocity in terms of access was not necessarily the most uh, impactful 
um, way of uh, looking at this. Um, as I said, we are pursuing reciprocity. Um, and we say that reciprocity needs to be looked at across all areas of the relationship. Um, but I just want to uh, underline that um, as institutions and as authorities, we do um, need to look at um, questions of human rights, questions of values, um, but also questions of um, uh, the economy and jobs and um, cooperation on global issues such as climate change, where China is an important player. So we do have a responsibility to look at this right across the piece. And um, uh, so there is a debate to be had about whether we should uh, pursue um, reciprocity um, on uh, individual narrow issue baskets. Um, but I would just be very open and say, uh, frankly, that's not um, where the um, where the politics of this is right now. I think a number of people have alluded to that. And I would say that um, I think it's very much the role of um, of the parliament, of parliamentarians, of civil society, and NGOs to continue um, advocating and um, highlighting the responsibility of. Um, political authorities also to uphold um, the European values and holding them accountable for that. Um, so, as I said, the debate is not um, there right now. I, um, there is not currently a, um, uh, a debate about um, uh, the same kind of um, legislation as, was, as it's been uh, adopted in the US, although this event shows that maybe the debate is uh, is uh, starting, but I, I would say the mood, um, the mood is shifting, the mood is um, changing more generally. That is also um, something that uh, I fully agree with what the um, former special representative of the Dalai Lama uh, said, that there was in the past a more um, a naive attitude about um, China um, transforming and opening um, automatically as a result of integration to the global economy and I think it, there's been a shift also in Europe that that is not something um, that, that happens uh, automatically and we do have um, distinct and in many ways uh, divergent and compatible um, values. So turning specifically to the question of, um, of human rights, um, the upcoming anniversary of the Universal Declaration of course um, should bring all of us to reflect on the core values enshrined in that declaration. Um, and uh, sadly, the uh, 2018 is not only the anniversary of that declaration, but also of the, um, the signature by China of the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is still not being ratified, and also the anniversary of the um, domestic protests of 2008. So when it comes to human rights in China, we, uh, we do, as EU, acknowledge the um, progress that China has been making on uh, social and economic front. Um, however, um, we, it's very clear that the um, overall situation on human rights in China has uh, deteriorated uh, markedly. Um, and uh, we, uh, we read the deterioration of the situation in Tibet um, in view of this wider trend in China. Uh, at the recent um, Universal Periodic Review of uh, China, China's human rights, um, in, in Geneva earlier this month, um, the international community has shown that, um, that also Tibet is a major concern. Um, as you all know, the European Union as such is not represented at the at UPR, <coughs> it's through the uh, member states, uh, but 14 um, of the EU member states um, um, focus on the protection of ethnic minorities, human rights, especially um, Uyghurs and also Tibetans. We've also raised the issue of Tibet uh, in the multilateral framework um, at the third committee uh, in New York recently in an omnibus statement and at the uh, UN Human Rights Council um, in our so-called item four statement. Uh, and we've also raised the situation for Tibet um, and um, called for um, uh, reciprocity and registered our concerns and called for um, access um, bilaterally, uh, in particular in our latest uh, EU-China human rights dialogue and um, whilst I, I think um, uh, in some criticism about uh, complaisance uh, or timidity um, can be justified, I would uh, challenge anybody who um, 
who participated in or witnessed the um, human rights dialogue with the Chinese uh, that took place in July to accuse the, um, the representatives there of, uh, of complaisance. Um, at that uh, dialogue, we submitted a list of cases, including Tibetan activists, writers, and religious figures who face criminal charges or have been imprisoned merely for exercising their right to freedom of expression. That includes Tashi Wanchuk and uh, Tashi Dodger. Um, so we are um, strongly pursuing questions of uh, promotion of human rights and the rule of law with China, and that will continue to be a core part of our engagement with China. Um, overall, with China, as I was um, suggesting in my opening comments and response, uh, we have a, a multifaceted approach. We neither want to be in a, in a mode of all-out uh, unconditioning and unconditional uh, engagement, nor all-out uh, confrontation. So we have a multifaceted approach, um, which according to the issue, on some issues we cooperate, on some issues we negotiate, on some issues we compete and we, and we challenge. So and that's where the reciprocity question comes in. Human rights, no question that is part of it. Yeah, the thing is, yeah. like we're, at, we're, we're being asked to vacate. Okay. Uh, and I apologize so, very much. Well, I just to, want to uh, mention, I was planning to go on and say some words also about uh, Xinjiang. Um, and, uh, um, but I'm, I'll stop there. <coughs> I, I, yeah, I do apologize. Um, uh, I, but thank you very much for the can I just also say that um, engagement with civil society and in particular organisations like um, the International Federation of Human Rights and um, the uh, International Campaign for Tibet are an integral part of our uh, engagement with China and human rights. We work closely with them to prepare the dialogue um, and, uh, and we have our role and if they have our role, it's very important that we should, we should continue to pursue that and to work together. Thank you for those remarks. And um, this is, I, I think, the beginning of a conversation, as you alluded to. Um, so uh, we'll continue it at another time. Thank you very much for uh, your remarks and for your attendance. And before you applaud, let me uh, thank uh, the International Federation for Human Rights, which co-sponsored today's event. And unfortunately, because we're getting the hook, um, they can't say uh, goodbye themselves. Um, so thank you, and have a good evening.